Yes, it is that time. Captain's cast rides again. Let's get it started, Mr. Producer. Ahoy! How are you? Welcome to the Captain's Cast. I am Captain Garrett of the channel Swords and Starships, and we are a ship of war on this channel. Live on YouTube, Rumble NX, formerly Twitter, and uh, I have seen Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. And uh, I am... My thoughts on this are typically complex, and so we will dig into that, and I, the, the stack of stuff is loaded for bear. Foe Man Blue has made me aware that I have some competition today. The captain has competition. All the heavy hitters are over there at, uh, George, I, I dare I say the chat, George the Giant Slayer's channel. All the heavy hitters are over there. Uh, I'll have to watch that on the restream. <laughs> I will. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have that on the restream. So listen, the captain's just gonna tell you, you know, Fubad Blue said you better be on your game. We are always on our game here on the captain's cast. We've got shills. Fu Man Blue, we've got Grizzly Shills. We, we, we have J J.K. Rowling is going to war with the wackos. We got, <laughs> we've got that. We've got um, uh, uh, trailers galore because uh, we've got to talk about acolyte. Uh, I have you have not heard the most trenchant, insightful analysis until you have heard what the captain has to say about acolyte. Uh, and Alien Romulus, uh, House of the Dragon. Is the captain team black or team green? Well, how are you going to know if you don't stay? That's all I'm saying. But that being said, there will always be the restream as well. So, you know, do as you must. Uh, do your worst, chat, for I will do mine. Count of Monte Cristo, anyone? I love that movie. I got... Uh, I've got an oat milk latte, so I'm very happy. Well, my dear chat, let's get off to the races. And are you serious already? Wrangler with a $4.20 super chat. Why Wrangler? That is most generous of you. A round of applause for Wrangler. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you mightily. I'm going to rethink drinking from a straw on stream. <laughs> I'm going to seriously rethink that. I don't like how that comes across. I, you know, I just put a little freaking umbrella in it. It'd just be perfect. Uh, but in any case, thank you, Wrangler. Thank you very kindly, sir. And, uh, you know, I don't even know where to start today because we have so much. But we've got lots in the chat. We have we have uh, Programacion Evolis 3D is in the chat. Says, sup, sup, pro Programacion. Fu Man Blue says hail. Hail Fu Man Blue. You can run both streams at the same time. You can do that. <laughs> You'll just, just mute George and just listen to the captain. <laughs> I mean, I'm just giving you advice here. Staff Yare is in the chat. You scurvy dogs, put your backs into it. Woke ship off the starboard bow, prepare to fire as she bears. <laughs> Dude, I, the Star Fury is in fine form today. Fire as you bow. There's a great story. So as you know, your captain is an author himself. And I wrote the the sort of American Horatio Hornblower, Jack Aubrey character in Blood and Oak, which is a nautical tale, a man on a quest to save his sister from the dastardly Barbary pirates in the Age of Sail. And uh, in my research, I came across Admiral Preble, who was the American Commodore had uh, on his way to the Mediterranean to fight the Barbary pirates in the night he encountered an and he encountered a vessel but he didn't know who the vessel was he called across the water and said to the vessel identify yourself this is back in the days before radio communication you had to yell you had to be able to yell and so he yelled across the other vessel and I yeah, this is terrible I cannot remember I'm pretty sure. I can't remember if it was French or British. I, I have to double check my notes. But I'm going to say British just to give Star Fury a little needling. So there was a British vessel and uh, they were refusing to identify themselves. And uh, he and 
Preble at the time was an unpro unproven Commodore, so his men didn't really know whether he was, they didn't really like him. He seemed like not the, the coolest guy. But uh, he changed their minds that night because he got so fed up with them. I think it was the French, actually, if I'm being honest. It was the French. And they're like, suck les bleu! We wrote out to you! And so he said, blow your matches, boys! And uh, Which at that time meant uh, get ready to fire guns. And then they're like, okay, okay, we'll identify ourselves, you know? I just think that's awesome. He was he was ready to tear him to shreds. He's like, screw you. You're not going to identify. That's because Americans have what we call natural American pugnacity. It's one of our defining characteristics. Fu Man Blue says, yeah, I'm watching that tomorrow for sure. Would that be, oh, uh, Ghostbusters? Yes. Sell it, Captain. I appreciate that, Fu Man Blue. Captain's going to put his back into it today. Def, I'm competing with George the Giant Slayer, and he's not called the Giant Slayer for no reason, folks. Stop here, he says. Sorry, I'm Team Purple. <laughs> what would that be like? The Purple Wedding? Is that? Come on, stop here. You, you know, it's this is multiple choice, and there's no you can't you can't vote for uh, none of the above. You have to vote black or green. Those are your choices, stop here. Right? I'm gonna. <laughs> There's, you should like that show, Star Fury. There's all kinds of British accents in it. Uh, I I love how I love how fantasy equals British accents. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Uh, also, also science fiction future equals British accents. Also, modern day supervillains equals British accents. I it's it's just the default setting. Okay. Yeah. That. Star Fury is he is on a war path today. He says, if I was Preble, I would have given them the broadside. <laughs> you wouldn't have stopped at a warning. You wouldn't have said, uh, I, you just start a war. You would have started a war with France, Star Fury. That, that's why that was so significant, because the United States back then was no superpower. And it was kind of it was kind of caught between the French and the British who were the superpowers. And America could not just afford to start wars with just anyone. <laughs> that now we can. Now we could do that all the time, and it's totally cool. Uh, it'll all work out. But, but 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 back then it was like a big deal. So the fact that he was willing to to literally engage a possible French or British ship uh, that was a big deal. That was a big deal. But he wasn't stupid about it. He was like, all right, they identified themselves and they're friendlies, and they can go. Stormcrow is in the chat, says, no, it's it's just Captain will suffice, Stormcrow. Captain will suffice. Uh, Today has been miserable, but the only thing keeping me going anymore is the promise of exploring the wasteland with you. Stormcrow, take heart. Don't let not your heart be troubled. We have so much fun entertainment today. Keep that chin up. There's good news out there, folks. There's good news out there. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah, just, just Captain will suffice. Act, uh, just, you can just call me Garrett. It's fine. Whatever you want. Whatever you want, chat. Uh, Regler says, blame James Bond for villains having British accents. In fact, I blame James Bond for spies having British accents. It's preposterous. It's preposterous. Uh, Fu Man Blue says, British accent is common in fantasy because the rest world knows it's just an affect they put on to make them seem superior. Right, stuff, you right? You know, we used to have a version of this in American cinema called what they call the North Atlantic accent, which is like if you watch if you watch any film from like the you know the forties or the fifties, like an Audrey Hepburn film, you'll hear this kind of uh, this kind of elite northeastern accent, don't you know, darling? And it's like it's like that's not a real accent. Nobody ever had that. It's like that old timey movie. Well, that's the North Atlantic accent. That was that was what they did. And I think they should, in fact, the captain likes, I like to do a North Atlantic accent once in a while. So yeah, where, where should we go first? I mean, I, I have lots of thoughts on this Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. And as I put in the title, this is an action movie that moves at a glacial pace. <laughs> so I, I'm kind of, I I, I I came out of the theater with uh, Ghostbusters Frozen Empire, and I kind of had almost exactly the identical reaction that I had to the Afterlife movie. I mean, almost identical. It was like, I'm sort of split down the middle. I kind of, one half of me had fun and sort of enjoyed it and was like, oh, I love all those cool, I love all the cool lore. 
And then the other half of me was like, uh, this was a bunch of gobbledygook. Like, this was a bunch, of, you know? So, so th this is what I will say for Ghostbusters. Uh, it's a movie that does not hate the Ghostbusters, and it's a movie that does not hate you. <laughs> like, that's all I could really say for it. It's a movie that has its heart in the right place. It really does. And that's sort of the charm. But uh, I had a normie with me, and the normie's reaction was uh, all those characters were boring. And so we just went ahead and watched the Ghostbusters uh, original movie, which I recommend. Allow me to... I've talked about this before. Let me explain what the problem is with all of these remakes and prequels and reboots and uh, and and, like... 40 years later sequels and all this stuff. The problem with all of these things is that they are not based, they're not drawn from an original idea, okay, that is, that it, that is about life, right? An original idea from life. This film, Ghostbusters Frozen Empire, is about Ghostbusters. The movie, it's about Ghostbusters, the cultural phenomenon. It's about Ghostbusters, the iconography. It's about Ghostbusters, the phenomenon that it was in the 80s. This is not, a, but, but what was Ghostbusters about? What was Ghostbusters 1984 about? Well, Ghostbusters 1984 was a clever sort of comedic take on real paranormal theory right? There were people, it, and still are. They're called ghost hunters. There are real people who try to use real scientific techniques to measure ghost activity and paranormal activity, and so it was a spinoff. It was basically, it was basically taking the idea of a bunch of pseudoscientists who are trying to, like, legitimately investigate paranormal sciences at a university with actual university funding, uh, using the actual lore, like the real life lore, because Dan Aykroyd grew up with all that stuff. So he really did understand things about the occult and and uh, paranormal stuff. You know, Dan Aykroyd is kind of a tinfoil hat guy in that way. So he, he knew all that stuff. So things like book stacking and, uh, you know, paranormal valences and just stuff like that was all real stuff. That's real stuff that to this day is are real theories about paranormal activity. But what if, you know, what if a bunch of crackpot scientists who lost their university funding because they're crackpots decided to turn it into a business? They invented technology that allowed them to have a business. That's why Ghostbusters was so good, because it was about something real, which sounds silly. It's a movie about guys who are literally wrangling ghosts, you know, with fantasy proton packs. But, but the point is that that idea was based in reality, which was real paranormal theories, uh, real, the, the, kind of the, the, the very real idea of crackpot scientists trying to prove their theories in the real world and being rejected by the world, and then blending that with comedy and great character interplay. Ghostbusters Afterlife and Ghostbusters Frozen Empire are about that movie that happened all those years ago. And that is why, uh, just like Argyle, which is about the James Bond trope, just like all Disney Star Wars, which is not about adventures in a galaxy far, far away, because that's a real idea. A real idea. What if you were in a galaxy far, far away and you were fighting an evil empire? That's not what Disney Star Wars is about. Disney Star Wars is about Star Wars, the movie. The, the the toys, like the phenomenon, the cultural iconography, that's what it's about. And that's the problem. That's the problem with all of this new stuff. And it's why it's boring. And it's why th there's an odd fundamental misunderstanding that Frozen Empire seems to have about what made the original film great. So we'll get into that some more. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dig into that more on the stream. But... Uh, <laughs> Stafiere has a simpler take. Uh, Stafiere, our sweet prince across the pond, says uh, one simple reason why all remakes don't work. They are shit. <laughs> They're shit. They're shit. Now, 
Now, I will not, I don't think Frozen Empire was shit. Number one, because the movie doesn't hate me. <laughs> like, it's, a, it's nice to watch a movie that doesn't hate my guts. <laughs> because I'm a toxic fan. Let alone all the other isms I'm no doubt guilty of. Uh, yeah, it's, but, but it's also the fact that, it, like, it doesn't hate the source material. I actually think the problem of Frozen Empire and Afterlife, I could, it, frankly, they're the same to me. Afterlife, Frozen, they're the same movie to me. I, I will say I enjoyed Frozen Empire a little more than Afterlife, because I think the setting of, of the actual, uh, well, the Empire State, I think being actually in New York, in the old firehouse with some of the old Ghostbusters, Ray Stance being a big part of the movie, I and also Winston, who I actually think was, he actually was the most kind of interesting of the Ghostbusters, the returning Ghostbusters, because he actually seemed to have a really good story-driven reason for being in the plot, in the, in the movie, but he actually, just the actor, Ernie Hudson, seemed to have a lot more life to him, Whereas uh, Dan Aykroyd and especially Bill Murray, they they just felt like they were being rolled onto the screen to just <sighs> get a hit of oxygen. And <sighs> it's like it's like Patrick Stewart doing Picard. It's like, <sighs> Robbie, uh, we have to we have to stop the Borg. It's like, oh, my God, it's so painful to watch these old geezers. You know, it's like Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. And he is like, oh, well, I'm Indiana Jones, and I, I really, really got to have fine to the dial gesture. And it's like, they, it's like they can't talk. They're so slow. They're, they're old geezers, man. And I'm like, listen, I love them. I love these actors. They have a special place in my heart forever. But there's a day when the day comes when it's time to hang it up. I'm not happy to tell them this. I'm just, look, I'm just being real here, okay? But uh, <clears throat> so so the problem with Frozen Empire, though, is the same problem Afterlife had. And, and this is a this is a difficult needle to thread here, because on the one hand, I despise the self-referential meta MCU bullshit humor that's constantly nitpick, that's constantly undermining tension and making fun of the premise of the film within the film. You know what I'm talking about? Just the classic example, the Halo line where he's about to explain how hyper light travel works and a girl boss with shaved head tells him to shut the F up, right? Uh, and it's like, that stuff bugs me. But the weird thing is that the, go and while Ghostbusters does not do that, which is good, it actually kind of goes to the other end of the extreme, which is it takes Ghostbusters too seriously. Now, now... It's hard to articulate what I mean by this because yes, I want them to take the the premise and the world seriously and I don't want them to like make fun of it and be ashamed of it like most science fiction is these days. I guess the the best way I can put it is that, but they seem to misunderstand the the sort of tone and 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 point of the first two Ghostbusters films. The the first two Ghostbusters films are a blend of comedy, uh, science fiction, paranormal theory, and uh, and essentially a kind of a superhero tale, a superhero tale. And the, the Ghostbusters Afterlife seems to just take it all very, maybe that's what I'm saying. I think Ghostbusters Afterlife takes everything super literally, right? And, and what it ignores is there was there was chemistry. The, the first two Ghostbusters films were actually brilliant storytelling and brilliant character work because you had different character archetypes that were playing off of each other. The biggest problem with Frozen Empire is that th they had way too many characters and most of those characters were the same character repeated over and over and over again from an archetype sense. And they did, and they were missing some of the critical archetypes. Um, Stop here. He says, wow, that's a low bar. It doesn't hate me. Sorry, Captain. Enough. I need decent writing, and I can't agree with your opinion on this one. Dude, stop, Yuri. <laughs> but by all means, I will not try to convince you to agree with me. I'm totally fine. You know, if you think my take is shit on this, you know, you, you have the captain's permission, Stop here, to, 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 no mutinies, but you can fire at the captain. Um, no, that's a totally fair take. I, I agree with you. Listen, 
that is a low bar. That is a super low, stupid bar. And I'm not giving this movie a pass because it doesn't hate me. I'm saying it's about six bars out of 10 on the epaulets. That's what I'm giving it. I enjoyed enough of it that I didn't hate that I saw it. <laughs> what, what are we doing here, folks? What are we, I did not. I did not want to flee the theater. Okay, <laughs> that's that's the bar. Stafiri, Stafiri is correct in this matter. Um, <clears throat> okay, let's get to the positive. The positives of Frozen Empire. Okay, is uh, they had. I liked. I really liked Dan Aykroyd in it. I mean, yes, he was kind of doing the wheezy Picard Indiana Jones. <laughs> Oh, well, that's a, well, that's a, there's a PK valences. And it's like, you know, I enjoyed listening to, to, to Ray Stance being Ray Stance, but it was a very old geezer Ray Stance, which was tough. That was, that was difficult. That was difficult, but it was at least enjoyable to an extent. I enjoyed the lore the, the firehouse was beautiful. It was, that was great. Now it's, it's nostalgia bait. Trust me. It's member berries. I'm aware of this. And the member berries are strong with this one. There were the, there were elements of a good story in this mess. There were there were elements of a good story. I think the idea that Ernie Hudson, um, just to give you a quick summary of the film, uh, without I get am I going to do spoil? I'm not going to do spoilers. But basically, the setup of the film is, and if you're scratching your head about why this is the case, uh, you're correct because they don't really explain it. But uh, the whole family in afterlife that were in Oklahoma. Literally every character that was in Oklahoma in the first film has been imported to New York City. Every single one. Every single one. And I'm like, and for whatever reason, uh the the, the Spangler family, led by the mother, of course, <clears throat> who's not a scientist and never had any interest in her father, Egon Spangler's ideas, now is leading the Ghostbusters and is the lead Ghostbuster. Okay, why? <clears throat> and the film opens up with them. Uh, there is a nice cold open in 1904 that was a very cool little period piece. I like that a lot. Uh, but that's not, you know, that's not a lot of substance. Anyhow, um, in the in the present day, we have the Spangler family are just driving around New York and they're busting ghosts and they're chasing ghosts everywhere and everybody loves them. And it's like, oh, there go the Ghostbusters. And they do all this property damage and they destroy shit and they're inflicted. And, but for some reason, the city's OK with it. They just think they're super cool. Uh, and so that's what they're up to. And then uh, it turns out that there is <clears throat> Winston. They establish in a few lines of dialogue that Winston has uh, become a successful entrepreneur and he's a very wealthy businessman, which I like that element a lot. I think that fits his character. He was kind of the most business minded of the original Ghostbusters. I think Venkman was the only kind of he was a good salesman, but he was a terrible businessman, which is kind of what I like about Venkman. So Ernie Hudson is is this wealthy entrepreneur. And he bought the old firehouse and he has given it to the Spangler family so that they can be Ghostbusters. Why do they want to be Ghostbusters? I have no idea. I really don't. They just do. Okay. Uh, meanwhile, Ernie Hudson is research. He has this whole research facility that he's built in. I think it's like an old aquarium in New York. He's repurposed an aquarium. That's so odd. But he's repurposed an aquarium as this nonprofit research center cop button and he's researched that he or he's uh repurposed this as this research center where he's built like this massive ghost storage facility and he's researching all these ghosts they come into possession of this ancient artifact which has a super evil malevolent deity trapped inside it and eventually after a long glacial plot unraveling and we get about a thousand characters introduced finally this ghost gets loose and they and it's gonna be a frozen empire they have to stop them and then you see all the stuff that was in the trailer and there's some fun action scenes and what have you it's very difficult actually to summarize the plot in this film because i what's crazy about it is they imported every character from the first film podcast is now living with Ray and helping him make a YouTube channel, <laughs> which, although funny and kind of charming, wh why? <laughs> didn't, didn't he have a life in Oklahoma? 
He's just there. He's just there living with Ray. How did that work out? Uh, the whole Spangler family now live in the firehouse and are now Ghostbusters, and it's not ever really explained. Are they making money at this? Why did they decide to do this? What does New York think about this? How did they get New York to trust them? Why are ghosts back? Who's been busting ghosts in all the years before this? Like, there's a lot of weird sort of lore-building questions that are unanswered between the two films. And then they they added they added a bunch of new characters so so ernie has this whole like research center populated with uh oh, oh that's the other one lucky <laughs> lucky who's the chick she she was the uh she was the little friend of finn wolfhard's character in the first film and she was in oklahoma she now lives <laughs> in new york and she works for ernie why? <laughs> like, how did that happen? So so they just imported the whole cast. And then they add, they add a British scientist. Why? I He's a new character. They just added him. And then they added uh, Camille Jelani. Yeah, uh, Camille Nanjani. He's shoehorned into this as a new character. He actually does have some pretty funny lines. And there are some things with him that kind of work. But the problem is you have all of the old cast. Uh, of the you have all of the first cast of Afterlife, plus you have the old Ghostbusters, plus you have like three or four totally new characters. So this cast is bloated beyond belief. And this is the weirdest thing about the film. Phoebe, Egon, Egon Spangler's granddaughter, is clearly meant to be the protagonist of these of this franchise. And they clearly want her to be. And they sideline her in the beginning of the movie because she she's a minor, and so she's technically not, she can't be a Ghostbuster, and she's very sad about this, and they bench her. Which is weird because the in an almost meta way, the film benches its main character. Now here's the second problem with the film. This, I believe, I like Phoebe's character, I like her a lot, I think she, she represents the Egon kind of head up in the clouds, um awkward, you know, doesn't really fit in kind of character. And that works. Here's the problem. She doesn't have a foil. And if you don't know, in storytelling, a foil simply means an opposite, right? Uh, Egon only works as a character in the Ghostbusters because he's playing off of opposites, right? He's playing off of Ray, who, like him as a scientist, but unlike Egon, Ray has a sense of fun and play. To, to Ray... Everything is is toys and adventure. To Egon, everything is serious. As Egon puts it, I'm always serious, you know, which is a great line. But then Egon is also playing off of Vankman. Vankman is an opposite to Egon in that Vankman is not a serious scientist. And what's really great about Vankman is he doesn't even believe in any of this crap in the beginning of the movie. He doesn't believe in any of it. He thinks it's all bullshit. To him, it's just a grift so he can, like, get girls. That's basically what it is. So that's the total opposite to Ray and to Egon, right? So you have these three foils, just like Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. You have a triumvirate of characters. They are playing off of each other. They have elements of their personalities that both complement and clash with each other. Then you bring in Winston who is the opposite of all three of them because he is a blue collar guy. He is not a scientist. And also he doesn't actually care whether it's true or not. He just wants a paycheck. Well, you, you see, that's what makes the first film work. The problem with the afterlife and the frozen empire films is that they take like one archetype, which is the brainiac scientist like Egon, but then they do not give that character the proper foil to balance out the story, because essentially you have the do, do, the the what's the opposite of the MVP? I guess it's the LVP. The least valuable player in this movie is, uh, I guess, what's her name? Callie, Callie Spangler, the mom. She, she is a freaking soccer mom who, who is who is as bland and boring and vanilla a character as you can possibly imagine. She It's like they imported her from a Hallmark movie. OK, she she has nothing to bring to the table. Yet she is leading the Ghostbusters. She is not a scientist. She is boring and bland. And she doesn't provide a foil to Phoebe. She doesn't provide a foil to any of the Ghostbusters. She's just there filling us up. Then you have Paul Rudd. Paul Rudd 
is closer to the Ernie character than any other character because he's not a scientist and he he doesn't really well well that I take that back he's a science teacher but but he's a fool that's the problem I I take it back he's not really like Ernie he's more like well he's just a fool He's a fool that doesn't take anything seriously. Now that can work in the story, but the problem is there's another fool in the story. That would be Finn Wolfhard's character, Trevor Spangler, who is a fool. Then you have Lucky, who is a normie, okay? Which again is a duplicate of Callie Spangler because Callie Spangler is a normie. I, actually, I would say those characters are closer to Winston because Winston is kind of a normie, right? Uh, and then you have... Who else in the film? You've basically got, um, oh yeah, you have Camille Nanjani's character, Nadim. He's a fool. So you have another fool, okay? Then you have uh, Podcast, right? Podcast is another normie, right? So what I'm saying is you have these archetypes that are repeated over and over and over again in the film, and they aren't the right archetypes to play off of Phoebe. So that's problem number one. And so what it created is a situation where the characters are boring and they're bland. And the plot, and because you have so many of the characters, the plot is literally trying to introduce all these different things and it's a complete mess. This film breaks all the rules in the save the cat genre system. Like, how would you classify Ghostbusters Frozen Empire as a genre? Is it a monster in the house story? Not really. I think it's kind of missing a lot of the key elements of a good monster in the house story. Is it a superhero story? Well, no, because it's not. It doesn't have a clear focus on who the hero. Honestly, there's more of a superhero story with uh, Nanjani's character than anyone else. He's more of the superhero arc in the whole thing. So it doesn't. And and Phoebe is benched for the whole movie, so she doesn't really have a good superhero arc. It's not a full triumphant story because it's not about Paul Rudd's character or Finn Wolfhard's character, even though they are fools in the movie and they they blunder their way through a bunch of shit. It's not really a... It could be kind of an... No, it's not an out-of-the-bottle film. I mean, it almost could be because of the weird uh, lesbian. You know, you know, there is, of course... You know, they, they can't help themselves, folks. Uh, they have... They basically have to have a teenage lesbian romance <laughs> with Phoebe's character playing chess in the middle of the night alone in Central Park with a ghost. And of course, y you know, th they just can't help themselves, folks. It's, it's, uh... Put a ticket in it, make her gay! Fuck Indiana Jones, put a ticket in it, make her name it gay! <laughs> there you have it. So, so they had to do that. They had to do that. So it defies, it defies classification. Now, the original Ghostbusters film is a superhero film. Right? In the rules of a superhero film, you need a superhero with a special power and a curse, right? And in the case of the original Ghostbusters, their superpower is that they have invented technology which allows them to stop, to chate, to hunt ghosts, basically. That's their special power. Their curse is that the whole world thinks they're crackpots. The whole world thinks that they're liar. They're either scammers or they're crackpots. That's basically what the whole world thinks. And so they, they kind of are the enemies of the city up until the end of the film. <clears throat> and ditto in the second Ghostbusters as well. They have a nemesis, which is Gozer, right? Gozer represents the nemesis of the Ghostbusters, uh, and they have to go up against. It's, it's a god versus mortals armed with technology. That's pretty brilliant. <laughs> I have to say, that's pretty brilliant as, as uh, superhero stories go. And they have the journey of a superhero arc, right? Um, that's what Frozen Empire should be, and it should be about Phoebe as the as the superhero, but she must have a triumvirate. Now, here's how I would have changed Frozen Empire, okay? Because I was thinking about it. I was thinking, as much as I enjoyed the firehouse, and as much as it was nostalgic, and as much as I, I mean, it really was. It, you know, it, it was just like the scene in The Flash with Bruce Wayne in, you know, Michael Keaton playing Bruce Wayne, and they're in that kitchen, the like the recreated kitchen from the Tim Burton films. It was just like that. It was like I'm walking through the ghost house and it just it's perfectly recreated. But is that a story? Not really. So I would ditch that whole thing. And what I would have it be is that Phoebe d delete like more than half the characters in this movie, by the way. Phoebe is is on a kind of internship at Winston's research ghost research facility. 
Because I actually think Winston was one of the stronger characters in the film in terms of like he actually had like a reason to be there. And have it be that he's researching an uptick in paranormal activity. He purchased the ghost house because he wants to preserve the site so that all the incarcerated ghosts can't get loose. I think that would fit better. And uh, the problem is you could still have this whole arc of how Phoebe wants to do more, but she can't because she's too young and she's got a lot to learn. And you kind of have a master apprentice relationship between Winston and Phoebe. But then Phoebe starts doing some things she's not authorized to do. She goes to the ghost house and tries to investigate a theory about an evil ghost who's going to get loose. And she gets in trouble, gets injured or something. And Winston, you know, gives her a lecture and benches her. And so that's part of the story. And then you introduce a couple of characters that she can play off of. Now, the problem with this is that, honest to God, there aren't very many. There's really almost no interesting characters in this. I, I mean, I don't really like podcasts all that much. I don't really like, I really dislike Finn Wolfhard's character. He's boring. I don't understand why he's here. I really dislike the mom. She, she is a boring Hallmark movie character. Why is she here? I really dislike Paul Rudd's character. I really dislike how he's just a fool. He's just a fool. One fool is fine. We don't need five. We don't need five fools in this movie. Uh, Lucky, what is she doing in this movie? She was a rando in the first movie. You know, so so the problem is that uh, who can Phoebe play off of that is equal to something like her version of a Ray Stance or a Peter Vankman? She doesn't really have that in the movie. And I feel like that's really the biggest problem with it. But I do think that Ray, Winston, and Phoebe could be sort of the core that's driving the narrative. And then at the end of the film, the final set piece as a kind of battleground takes place in the in the, in the firehouse. And I think that that would have worked better. But you still got to have a couple of characters that are larger than life and interesting that can play off of Phoebe. And I think, honest to God, uh, I don't know how Stranger Things does it. But Stranger Things is able to do this with child characters because they create characters that have different qualities and they complement each other. You know, like the character of Eddie in Stranger Things season four was unbelievably brilliant. You know, he played off of Dustin's character really well. You know, j just take the character of Steve, who starts out as a high school bully in Stranger Things season one, and how he kind of winds up the sort of babysitter <laughs> over the course of... And, and he develops this friendship with Dustin. And what's great about Steve and Dustin is that Steve is sort of good with girls and he's 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 the cool kid. He had some popularity in school, uh, but but he was a slacker and didn't really study. Dustin, on the other hand, is super genius, but he's a nerd and he doesn't really he doesn't know how to talk to girls. And uh, he's he's never been cool. He's never been in the club. So Steve and Dustin have this really great relationship where they play off of each other. And they have a way of doing this in Stranger Things that works really well. They pair characters with other characters that play off of each other and kind of bounce off of each other's personalities, right? So, like, for example, Nancy and Jonathan are excellent foils to each other because Nancy is this very, she's this very uh, preppy, uh, very kind of snooty, um, overachiever type girl. And then Jonathan is a kind of outsider, you know, weirdo, and he's kind of misunderstood and quiet and introverted. And, but he's had a harder life than her. She's had this kind of, this kind of, privilege. She, she's had she's had a easier life in the middle class, whereas Jonathan has been through a broken home and he's from a poor family and he has big dreams, but not not a lot of luck. Right. And so those two characters have great conversations where Nancy is bitching about the fact that the that the newspaper people won't let her do what she wants to do. And he says, Nancy, you've got to pay your dues. You've got to work your ass off. And it's like you've had things handed to you. But in the real world, nobody gets anything for free. And it's like, now that's a great conversation because those characters are different and they come from different backgrounds. That's the main problem with Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. I felt like every single character in this movie was a kind of clone of, of like four or five other characters that are all in the movie. <laughs> like they're all in the movie. I would almost say that you could, you could almost have the engineer, you could almost have the engineer character, the British guy, you could almost have him be the foil to a Phoebe because he is intelligent and he he understands the theories, 
but he's he's an adult and he's mature and uh, he's actually earned his stripes and that would that would clash with the fact that Phoebe is still green. She has a lot to learn. So I, I'm I'm just saying I think that but at the end of the day, they love the lore and this film is well meaning. A lot of the nostalgia was a lot of it was pretty good. Like I enjoyed one thing I loved about this was that Ray would would sort of rattle off the exposition of like the ghost theories and like the ancient lore and all that stuff. And it and it was not done in a way that was making fun of itself. There was no stupid jokes that were interrupting him. Nobody was saying shut up, nerd. There was none of that meta humor that was getting in the way of Ray being Ray, right? And that's what I'm talking about when I say the heart this movie's heart was in it in the right place. And that's the part of it I enjoyed. That's the part of it I liked. I enjoyed but but what I will my my kind of last word on this is that um I I started to get in a rhythm with this film because they had so many they, they had so many little moments that were deliberate recreations shot for shot of a beat from the original films and it was meant as a nod like for example Finn Wolfhard stumbles on Slimer in the attic which is admittedly a pretty funny and and delightful scene however they have the whole thing where Slimer is looking at him and it's it's a shot for shot recreation of Ray in the hallway saying or, or a Venkman in the hallway saying it's looking at me, Ray. And then it slimes him and it disappears through the wall and it leaves a trail of slime. They literally recreate that with Finn Wolfhard. They did so many things like that throughout the whole movie. It was be, it, it's like, have you ever watched a sitcom and you know exactly the moment when the next joke is going to happen because it's literally like a 30 second interval that you're going to have another joke and more audience and audience laughter. That's what it felt like to me. It was like, I'm just waiting for the next Easter egg from the original. And it's, it was distracting. It was literally distracting because there's a scene where the Ecto one is driving across the bridge. I, I absolutely expected them to start playing the piece of the soundtrack from the original film when Ernie and Ray are going across the bridge. And that was distracting to me. Cause I'm like, stop. Stop just recreating beats from the original and you can reference the original, but you don't have to literally make every other moment this. So what I'm going to say is it's a movie that doesn't hate you. It doesn't hate the lore. It tried. It was it was a well-meaning mediocre film. And that's more that I could say for most of the crap we get. So the captain is giving this film, Ghostbusters Frozen Empire, a six out of 10 bars on the epaulets. It's a, it's a nice piece of forgettable entertainment, but you know what it'll make you want to do? It'll make you want to just watch the original. And then you'll watch the original, and you will see that the beats, the you know, the rules of storytelling, especially in a film, in a feature-length film, you just, if you break them, you break them at your own peril. So there you have it. Uh, yes, uh, let's see here. Mm. Catch up on the chat. Stop here. He says, obviously, the Ghostbusters are part of BLM. All their Ghostbusting is mostly peaceful. I don't, where, where the, you know, I, there was kind of an odd thing that occurred to me in this film because there's a lot of sort of gleeful celebration of all the cool ways they entrap ghosts and they imprison ghosts and they store ghosts. And uh, <clears throat> I couldn't help but think that, like, isn't this just a little screwed up? <laughs> like, like what? I mean, if the ghosts are bad ghosts, but but like, so so they just have to be stored for all eternity. <laughs> like that's kind of messed up, man. And uh, there, there's a lot of uh, I think the problem is that there's a way to address it without it turning into some stupid SJW bullshit. There's a way to address it, but the film really doesn't. The film just kind of, and I think God, there would be so many activists. <laughs> there would be so many activists who are like, free the ghosts, free the ghosts. We need ghost prison reform. <laughs> you just know there would be. And look, I will say that it's not, it's not woke. I mean, yes, there is a lesbian romance. It's completely unnecessary. And uh, because a romance arc for Phoebe was totally unnecessary in this film. And, and it's a very plot-driven thing. There's a very plot reason why this little romance happens. And the problem is it's very, it, it, it slows the film down. Like every scene with Phoebe and this ghost is, oh my God, this is like the most boring CW crap. It, it, it drags the film down. So it's not even the fact, it's just any, 
There was no reason to have any of that B-plot with her. There just wasn't. Um, but is it woke? No, but it's unnecessary to me. It's just as it, it dragged the film down. You can't you can't devote so much time to Phoebe's subplot if you're not willing to organize the film properly around the core. There's no core characters in this. That's the biggest problem. There are no core characters in this film. I mean, that's why I chose the thumbnail I chose. If you look at the thumbnail for this live stream, there's 50 characters. <laughs> there's 50 characters in this movie. It's ridiculous. And there's not even room for like half of that. So... You know, the original Ghostbuster, there's three. There's and they add Winston later. That's like and Janine Janine's a side character. She is not a core character. She does she becomes that in the second film, but that's like that's like a handful of characters, you know. Anything more than ten characters and you have you basically have more of a TV series on your hands. So Stoff here, that is reassuring. He says no mutiny here so far. So no ritual Harry Carry at the cinema. No. I mean, yeah, I mean, this is like one of the, I would have rather seen Dune again. Uh, seriously, I'd rather have just seen Dune Part 2 again. But uh, let, let me let me be a shill for Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. Uh, a lot of people are hating on this film, uh, but I, I thought it's fine. It's okay. I did not hate this. There was a lot in this that I mostly did not hate that I was seeing. So it's basically, it's, I mean, it's, I mean, why can't people just enjoy it? <laughs> uh yes programmation i probably missed that you know i was watching a drink with crazy he's really good at staying current on the chat the captain is you know i have a it's hard for me to switch streams but i'm trying to get better at it you know yeah oh got that one uh Fu man blue says the cast was so bloated because they were forced to put in the old cast and still meet the dei requirements i mean i won't say that this was overtly that way but i tend to agree with you i mean like lucky is the most superfluous character in this whole film and lucky was the diverse uh girlfriend of finn wolfhard's character in the first one and it's like uh she was totally tacked on she was a duplicate of like she she could easily be the same she could stand in for the role of podcast she could stand in for the role of finn wolfhard's character what's his name i don't care trevor who cares? I, I don't care. She could stand in for the mom. They're the same character. They all fill the same role in this film. So there's no actual reason for her to be there. So that's what I tend to think is like, but you can't, you can't have a diverse character not return. So there is that pressure there. What do I always say? Uh, wokeness is what let the fox into the hen house in the film industry. What is the fox? Well, the fox is mediocrity. It is, it is, it is filling quotas. That's what it is. Y you know, what's also crazy yesterday, yesterday, I just happened to see the show, the, the film fast times at Ridgemont high. Okay. Which came out in 1982, I believe. Yeah. 1982, I think. Um, fast, I had never seen it before. And so I'm watching it. And aside from, from just being blown away by how the eighties was such a better time for film and how there were actually fast, you could tell fascinating character driven stories, you know, it's about a bunch of horny teenagers that are just trying to get laid in the final days of high school. It's amazing how much you can do with that when you're a talented writer. It's like, so I'm watching this. And what, what, you know, I, one of the first scenes is Sean Penn is, that I saw anyway, Sean Penn is in a car and he's sitting there with a friend of his who happens to be black. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, isn't it? It's so horrifying. It's so horrifying how there has never been diversity before the two thousands in any cinema. It's so, it's like, it's like I, I watch eighties films and there it's, they were filled with diversity. It is such a lie. It is such a lie that there were no strong women in movies. There were no diverse characters. There has been diversity in films and TV and everything for 40 years. Nobody had to go and found stupid consulting groups to make this happen. Now, is raising awareness about like preferences and higher, you know, th there's some value to that if I'm being totally charitable. But my point is, this was a problem that was already solving itself. 
And that's really the problem. You know, SJWs, they don't want problem solved. They never want to solve anything because their whole life is defined by their problem, by their stupid wacko problems. And so nothing that they do or advocate for is ever intended to result in a solution, no matter what they may say, no matter what they may have convinced themselves of. They do not want a solution. You know how I know? Because, you know, it's like, oh, gee, gay marriage is approved in America. You would think that would have solved everything. Oh, no. No, 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 no. There is way more injustice in the world. Anyway, anyway, I kind of <laughs> I went on a rant there. I'm just, I'm tired of it. I'm just, I'm tired of them picking and picking and picking at every little, they're little busybodies. All right, uh, stop here. It says the role of Patton Oswalt is to fuck things up by his presence alone. I, his his scene in the film, superfluous, completely. You just delete it. There's no reason for it. Programmation says, does he play a fool? Does he play a nerd? What? Okay, so uh, Patton Oswalt's character, he plays a he plays a plot device. Programmation. That's basically what he serves as. He is a he is a he's actually what Ray and Vankman and Egon used to be, which is he is a paranormal researcher working at the New York Library. He is a friend of Ray's, and Ray has to do some research on the ancient lore of the big bad in the film. And so he goes with Phoebe and podcast to the New York Library. It's really just an excuse so that we can go through the New York Library and have a recreation of all the member berries, they even show the the old the old lady that's reading in the book stacks uh, in the first film. They have her do her whole scare thing at Ray. It's and again, it's one of those. It's like one of those laugh lines. They have to have it in there. I'm just like, oh god. And and so the only purpose of Patton Oswalt is to be this scientist who delivers plot exposition in the stat in the book stacks. Basically, why not just have Ray do that? Just have Ray do that. <laughs> There's no reason for it. Well, I'll tell you the reason. The reason is member Barry. So he's a pointless character. He doesn't really, he, he, he literally is just a reason for us to go to the library and have member berries. That's all he is. I mean, I, did I hate him? No, because he was, he was what basically Vankman and Ray, he, he basically was what Ray stance was in the original, a, a crackpot paranormal scientist who loves what he does and thinks this is all super fun and delightful, which is what Ray was in the original film. So, so that's what I mean when I say like all the characters in this film are, they are all uh, duplicates. They're, they're extraneous. They are duplicates of, of four other characters that we already have filling this role in the plot. It's like, imagine if there were five characters in the first Ghostbusters film that were like Ray and three characters that were like Venkman and, uh, you know, two two or three characters that were like Egon. And then you had uh, 10 characters that were like Winston. That's basically what Frozen Empire is to me. It's like it's like just a multiplicity of, of roles that we already have. What this film needed was to be pared down to a core group of like four characters. And, uh, and those four needed to be foils to each other. And that's really the problem with it, so... And stop here. He says, of course, I am a toff after all. Fu Man Blue says, that's not a word. Quit trying to confuse me. He's British, Fu Man Blue. He can't help it. Stop here. Toff. A posh person can be socially awkward. I know, but the British sound so delightful when they're being socially awkward. No more straws on the pop, on the uh, captain's cast. Uh, let's see. Yes, Fu Man Blue has been watching The Gentleman. I I started that one, and I need to get back into it. I need to get back into it. Oh, yes, check my Discord. I'm sorry. I'm doing too many things. Fu Man Blue says, uh, one, you watched one episode of The Gentleman. Pretty damn good. Reminds me of Turn of the Century HBO. You have flipped on Yu Yu Hakusha. They spent a bunch of time setting up a big rescue to save the girls, but while they were storming the castle, one little girl played sick and overpowered a guard with brute force to free herself, because of course she did, and I was out. Of course she punched him in the balls and choked him out with a sleeper. <laughs> I know, it's so ridiculous. It's like, 
Yeah, I know. I know. And you also were talking about in the Discord. By the way, the link to the Discord is is uh, in the description. Join us. Join us on the Swords and Starships Discord. Uh, but Fu Man Blue, you mentioned that you were watching the show. Ra- what was it? Raised by Wolves. Is that the name of the show? I'm, it's the it's the uh, it's an HBO show, right? With and it's a Ridley Scott production. What was it? Uh, Raised by Wolves, I think, is the name of it. Raised by Wolves. Yeah, that's the name of it. Uh, starts out really interesting. It's about this these futuristic cyborg robots that have gone to another planet with these children that they are raising, and they are the refugees of this uh, this apocalyptic war on Earth that destroyed all of Earth. How much of Earth? I don't know. The show's not very clear on this. And it starts out as this very super interesting science fiction, post-apocalyptic, uh, extraplanetary adventure. And there's this kind of mystery about this war between these these sort of religious Luddites and this sort of hyper-technical civilization. And it just devolves into mystery box bullshit. And I'm like, I'm so, I'm so done with shit like this. I totally lost interest in it. I just totally lost interest. So yeah, uh, Storm Crow says, forgive my interruption. So there's no interruption, Storm Crow. You are part of the chat. The chat is part of the show. But what microphone are you using? I need to get a better one for our eventual session. And I think someone, I think Star Fury said, has it correct. Uh, sure is a good, that's what it is. This is a sure, what is the exact model? It's like the, it's like the basic, the, the, the classic sure microphone. It's an expensive one. I did not need to spend that much money on it. But hey, I have it. So there you go. It sat on my desk for like a year and a half before I ever did anything with it. That's called resistance. Uh, <laughs> that's called resistance. So I, I let's see. It's pretty similar to the, it might be the SM7B. That that would probably be it, but it's not like the most expensive Sure microphone. It's kind of I would say it's kind of middle of the road. Um, so yeah, I like it a lot. Definitely worth it. And I use uh, I have the Focus Right. I use a Cloud Lifter, and I also have a Focus Right. Uh, God, I'm so bad with this. I, my buddy who set me up with all this stuff is like an expert. Shit, what do you call that thing? The Focus Right. Somebody, it, the words on the tip of my tongue. The name of the device is what I'm looking for. Uh, US audio interface. I mean, what would you call this? It's basically an audio interface. Scarlet. It's the Scarlet audio interface. Scarlet. S I. Uh, this is the most. This is the most amateur hour. Scarlet 2i2. Scarlet 2i2. So I use that with a cloud lifter and the Shure microphone. And uh, it took me forever to figure out how to use all that. So <laughs> good luck to you. Good luck to you, Storm Crow. Yeah, MV7 or MV8. MV7 is a good choice. You can't you can't go wrong with that. Storm Crow says, don't leave until uh, Captain responds to the question you had. I sent it in Discord. Oh, I don't see it. Oh, you sent it as a direct message. I was in the general chat. Sorry about that. Boom, man, blue. Uh, but the stream, the restream will be up, so you, he can get the answer. And we have super chats to get to. Programmas says, Raised by Wolves, the new alien thing. Yeah, we're going to get it. Let's get into some trailers after this. <laughs> I'm not a scatterbrained storm crow. The captain is sharp as a tack. The captain knows exactly what he's doing. What was I saying? Fu Man Blue with a $20 super chat. Oh, my goodness. Oh my goodness. Fu Man Blue, tell me you did not spend $20 to tell me you sent a private message. <laughs> don't, don't. Fu Man Blue, I appreciate the generosity, but you never have to send a super chat. I was just behind on the chat. I'm working on it. I'm working on getting better at that. But thank you very kindly, Fu Man Blue. And have I addressed the answer? Uh, let's see. Fu Man Blue also says. Keeping in line with basing a story on something real, what do you say the story of Fallout is based on? Okay, so that's the question Stormcrow has. Keeping all right, I'm just gonna go to the top of the chat and I'll work backwards if I can. I'm just 
I've been thinking about that of like, I got to get better at that. So I'm sorry it took so long to get to that. Um, keeping in line with basing a story on something real, what do you say the story of Fallout is based? Well, it's based on the, the a nuclear war that destroys the world. That's pretty real to me. <laughs> I mean, that's real. Like, that's some real shit. I, 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 you're talking about when I said that um, something that's referential as opposed to something that is based on an original concept. I, I understand what you're asking, Stormcrow. Okay. So, so yeah, the, the use of the word real is a bit confusing in this context if I don't define it. But what I'm talking about is how, like, the original Ian Fleming novel of James Bond is based on, on a kind of mythical archetype of the knight errant, the western hero, the, the, the wandering explorer, the adventurer. He is, he is a modern take on the adventurer. That, that's kind of a philosophical, deep reading of it. But at a basic level, it's just based on the original concept of a spy, a globe-trotting spy, who is encountering the, the dastardly villains of the Cold War. And that's based on something original. That's based on a concept, right? And what something like Argyle is, is Argyle is based on the popular the popular zeitgeist of, of the James Bond trope, you know, the, all the memes of James Bond, basically it is a re animation of all the memes of James Bond. Oh, that'll be shaken, not stirred, Monty Bunny, you know, whatever it is. So when I say real, I guess another simpler word for that is original, but, but yeah. So how would, what would fallout be based on? <clears throat> I, I don't, it, what I would say is, you start from a place of curiosity. That's kind of what I think of it as. As the as the writer, like you start from a place of curiosity. And when I see Fallout, you know, that's where my mind goes is um what would it be like to live in this world? How would you survive in this world? What would happen if and I think there's already there's tons of originality in Fallout. I actually I actually think Fallout is something real at its core because it's based on the 1950s and 60s Cold War nuclear annihilation hysteria, juxtaposed with the kind of red scare propaganda of the time, and that's pretty original. And I do kind of get what you're going because I think that the problem with, in fact, I'll just grab this scene because I want to go over this anyway. But the new Amazon show Fallout, I'm getting the feeling that it's referential toward the game, but it is not referential toward that really unique idea that's underlying the game. So, so yeah, I would say that any story that goes back to the original concept of what is Fallout about is what I would consider real. That's what I would consider real. If you just want to tell, if I'm being very charitable to people that that criticize fan service, and I'm not, believe me, I'm not, because fan service is doing what I'm saying, which is going back to the root of the concept, right? But but if if there is a fair critique of fan service, I would say a better word for it is nostalgia or member berries, right? Which is what Frozen Empire is. Frozen Empire, yes is fan service, but it's fan service in a way that's kind of just like it's doing a cover band. It's doing a cover band of Ghostbusters, but it's not, it's not what Ghostbusters was. Ghostbusters was this original concept, right? And so I'm probably just, oh, you know, let me know if that answers your question. But yeah, I would, for me, it, that, that's difficult with Fallout because Fallout is kind of a world, you know, that, that's kind of like saying, how would you tell a real story in Dungeons and Dragons? Well, that's a hard question to answer because Dungeons and Dragons is a massive fantasy world with a lot of different stories you could tell. But what I would start with is characters and like, what is it? You know, going back to the, you know, this is the reason for if you if you read Save the Cat, this is the reason why Blake Snyder has the 10 genres, right? Superhero, institutionalized, monster in the house. The reason for those genres is to answer this question, what is it about, right? What is it? Now, the thing about Fallout is you could tell any genre story in Fallout. You could tell any story you want. You could tell a monster in the house story about a Meyer Lurk queen. You could tell, uh, or just a, an invasion of Meyer Lurks, uh, 
Fallout Far Harbor is kind of a monster in the house story, actually, which is pretty cool. The island is going to eat you. You could tell a, a Golden Flea story about a group of survivors on a journey to get some kind of primal treasure on the other side of the wasteland, right? You could tell a buddy love story about uh, a wandering bounty hunter with something missing in his life, and he runs into either a friend or a potential romantic interest who is different but brings something to the table that d they didn't know that they needed, right? Uh, I actually think Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom would have been a better movie if it was just about uh, Arthur and Orn, because Arthur and Orn were actually a really good buddy love story. They were estranged brothers who became sort of reluctant allies and then slowly start to become friends, sort of like Loki and Thor, right? Which is kind of a... Anyway, so my point is Fallout can be any of those things, but the point is how do you make it real? Well, you make it real by going to the root of that story. If it's going to be a buddy love story, start with who are these buddies and what is each of these characters missing before they meet each other? And what is their life like in the wasteland? What is the real implication of living in the ruins, right? What is that really like? And what is, what is driving them and what is it motivating them? And then you can ask yourself, and with what we know of the Fallout lore, what what other elements of the lore do we bring in? You know, is the Institute involved? Is the Brotherhood of Steel involved, right? Then you start bringing in those elements. So I think the problem is a lot of these creatives, they start with the superficial and they just use it as a skin for a basic narrative. And that's really what results in stories that I think are derivative and unoriginal and, in my definition, not based on anything real. So I hope that helps you, Stormcrow. Anthony says, sup, sup. Welcome, Anthony, says Fu Man Blue. Uh, yeah, basically, yeah, so just explaining that I'm answering a question from Stormcrow about how would you tell a real story? I, I mean, here's, here's what I would do. If I were doing Fallout the show, I think the best way to do Fallout the show it is kind of hard to choose, but I think a standard Golden Flea story is where my mind goes, which is if you don't know, a Golden Flea story is basically about a, a road trip, you know, a journey of some distance. And it is also about uh, a team of characters, and it's really about them changing, and they are on a quest for something primal. There is a prize that they want that is primal, right? And so in the case of Star Wars A New Hope, it is the quest to destroy the Death Star. That is the, you know, and the road is traveling, you know, traveling to Yavin, traveling to the site of defeating the Death Star, and the and the team is Han Solo, Luke, and Leia, right? So, so Fallout is perfect for that because it could simply be that there's a couple of characters and they're on a quest for something and they go on this road trip across the wasteland. And that would be great for a TV show. And this this character in the Fallout show, the the what is even her name? Does she have a name? I don't think they gave her a name, but uh, we'll just call her Strong Female Whammon. Strong Female Whammon character in the new Fallout show. Um, my biggest critique of the of the trailers is what does she want? Like, what? why is she leaving the vault? And you notice that every trailer is like this now. Watch for this, folks. Every trailer is like this. No story is, is offered. There is no clear narrative explored in the actual trailer that hooks you into the story. It's just stuff. It's just like, the wasteland is dangerous. You can't leave the vault. Okay, fine, but why is she leaving, right? Where are the stakes? So, And I'm not saying you have to give away the story, but you got to give us something. And so a better way to do it, in my view, is to say, we have four weeks of water left in this vault. And... Uh, you know, we're, we're working on a solution, but but for the time being, we have to keep this quiet. And she decides to defy that. And she says, what if we go to the surface and find... I'm kind of riffing on the plot of the first game, right? What if we go to the surface to get a, a, the part that we need? And they're like, no, it's forbidden to go to the surface because, you know, plot-driven reasons, right? And uh, and that's the hook, right? Is she is leaving the vault and she is she is risking exile and she's going out into a dangerous land she's unprepared for for a specific primal prize, which is to find the piece of equipment that will save the lives of everyone she's ever loved and known. On the way to that, she encounters the ghoul. She encounters the the Brotherhood of Steel guy. They form a team and together they go on these experiences that start to change them. 
right? That, that change them as they arrive. Fallout is also a great template for a superhero story. You could tell a story about a wandering adventurer or maybe a, a kind of someone who she could be a superhero, actually. It could be that uh, the vault is attacked and a bad guy, a nemesis, comes in and, and wipes out her whole family. And now she's on a quest to stop to get revenge, you know, something like that. Like, so you could just do so many things. But I think you have to start first with that character and what is that story. Anthony says, uh, the Fallout show looks like a bad fanfic cosplay. The ghoul guy seems cool, though. He, you know what? And I totally was na I was calling him David Goggins, and David Goggins is a really uh, badass. I think he's like a he's a motivational speaker, Navy SEAL, so that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, Walton Goggins is the name of the actor who plays the ghoul. And you are exactly right, Anthony. He is the only thing, and I didn't realize this consciously at first, but the more I watch the trailer, I'm like, he is the only thing I'm interested in in the trailer. He's kind of got, but even he doesn't have a clear motivation in the trailer. He doesn't really, and Anthony says, I like the Golden Fleece idea. That's the most obvious vehicle for a Fallout story, in my view. That's the, now, that also is kind of because video games typically are golden, from the perspective of the player, are always Golden Fleece stories. You were on a quest to do something or get something. So that's, that's just the template for a video game story. But, it works. Golden Fleece stories are among the most powerful and primal in, in all literature. I mean, they all are, but, but Monster in the House is the most primal story you can tell because it's about don't get eaten, right? It's the most primal story. It's why horror films are so... They, the, horror, there will always be a place for horror films because th that's what... It's the most primal thing that we know is don't get eaten by the monster. So, so that's, that's that. But Golden Fleece is about a quest, man. It's about how the journey changes you. And that's really what makes Golden Fleece stories so powerful and such a great tool. So I fairly agree with you. Let's dig into this. I, I have, we have the first scene of the Fallout show. You guys want to see this? Hopefully I don't get hit for this. I'm going to take, I'm going to take the risk. Um, but Amazon has been okay lately. They don't hit you for the trailer. So maybe they'll be chill about this. Um, but oops, hang on. Let me share a screen. Uh, yeah. And uh, let me grab that question you had, Stormcrow. You said, uh, quick pitch using Save the Cat. Blood of the Stars is a mixture between a monster in the house and a golden flea story. The monster is an alien bug hive inside a metro. I like well actually what I would say is the monster is the alien bug hive and the the house is actually the metro is the only thing I would say there. Um and by the way there is overlap because technically the original Ghostbusters film is also a monster in the house story because New York is the house the monster is Gozer. Um however it it's closer to a superhero story because of the characters of the Ghostbusters. So there there can be overlap. The purpose of the genre is not to pigeonhole you it is simply to make sure that you are clear in your mind on what is it. Because if you can't tell people what it, what the story is, you can't really sell it. And that's often a sign that there's something not working. There's something broken in the structure. So that it's a tool. It's a tool. More like guidelines than actual rules. And Stone Crow says, The Golden Fleece part comes in the form of blueprints the protagonist team needs to acquire in order to better map out the ruins of America in order to reclaim the world. It's pretty strong. I would say, you know, you you want, and I'm not, this is not a critique because I'm not saying there's anything wrong with this. I'm just saying your goal with that is to just tighten that concept as much as possible, right? You know, it's like uh, the, the blueprints, what, having a clear sense of what the blueprints will do, right? That, that's really the MacGuffin. You know, wh what they're looking for in Star Wars is the plans for the Death Star, right? Where are those plans that you stole? That's the key to defeating the Empire. That's made very clear in the story, and it's why it's so primal in the, in the original Star Wars film, because we are so... Same thing with Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? We know exactly what the Ark is. Well, I mean, do we know exactly what it's going to do? No, but we know exactly why it's important, right? Which is if the Nazis get it, they're going to use it for global domination, and we can't let them have it. It's a super weapon, basically, and we're trying to keep it out of the hands of the bad guys. 
And obviously, Lord of the Rings, the greatest of all Golden Fleece stories, the ring, the destruction of the ring is the prize that we're after because if it falls in the hands of the enemy, it's game over for the world. And if we don't, and if we destroy it, it's game over for Sauron. Like that's, that's beautiful. It's perfect. It's very clear. So, so blueprints is good. I like blueprints. Like if we find these blueprints, um, we'll win. Um, and what will we win? Right. And if we, and if the bad guy gets the blueprints, what do they get? That's a really good, important part of it. So you're on the right track there, Stormcrow, and I like it. So let's take a look. Now, let's take a look at a show that is not as clearly defined, and that would be Fallout on Amazon. I, I am definitely reviewing this one because I look, I love the Fallout games so much. And there is Fallout is a layup, folks. It's a layup. This should be the easiest thing to adapt, in my view. But here we go. First scene. <laughs> to ask you to leave him alone now i acknowledge that i'm unfamiliar with your circumstances but at first glance your treatment of this man appears unfair and i'm obliged to intervene now if your instinct is to harm me as a person simply trying to de-escalate a conflict then i'll have to assume of the two of you you are likely the primary aggressor in which case i think everyone in this town would agree the force is justified Unless you're willing. Uh, I have so many thoughts about this. Um, why are they portraying vault dwellers as these kind of egalitarian, self-appoint, like utopian? Like, like they they assume that their mission is to politely police the wasteland. This seems this seems naive in the extreme to me. I never got the feeling from the video games that vault dwellers, while while they are they are uninitiated, uh, uninitiated, and they are newcomers to the wasteland, gen in functioning vaults. Granted, because a lot of them are evil, twisted science science experiments, but the ones that are functioning as intended, they are they are trained to handle themselves in the wasteland, and they are given a general mandate to rebuild civilization. But but. Why is she acting like a mall cop? Like this is this is this is a suicidal attitude of, for her to have. This is a suicidal attitude for her to have right here. Like she is she is literally setting herself up to get gunned down easily. That's my issue with this. Is it so naive? Why is she so naive? Willingly stand down now. Fucking vault dwellers. Well, now that is a very small drop in a very, very large bucket of drugs. She said, Stand down. By the way, she just died. She just got killed. You realize that that's what that scene is saying at that exact moment, right? Because she. <laughs> she tried to use she tried to use a non-lethal <laughs> a non-lethal weapon on this guy who is clearly very dangerous, right? So she got basically what is exactly supposed to happen is uh he he basically had her dead to rights. And then plot armor. Plot armor intervenes. For some reason, that looks really cringe to me. I, I'm not trying to nitpick this. I, I really am not. But that looked clunky as hell. I, I did not love that when I saw that. I, why not just have him do one of the big jumps and just land like a big, you know, like, like just a truck landing. Knight Titus of the Brotherhood of Steel, stand down. Or be cut down. You gotta be fucking kidding me. Uh, we still have no clue what her goals are. We have no... Why is she there? Why is she intervening? That didn't tell us anything about the story. Why is the Brotherhood guy intervening? 
I did. I'm not wild about this at all. I really, she, she basically has plot armor. That is a big red flag for this show. If this is the way they're going to approach storytelling, this is crap. Like this, th I think this show is going to be garbage. I really do because uh, th there are ways to get at her being naive, but confident. You know what I'm saying? Like, like if she, she had good training and she decided to intervene, but she did it in a freaking smart way. You know what I'm saying? Like she, she actually uses some tactics. Maybe she gets it. She gets behind some cover and she lines them up with a sniper rifle. And then she can say, you know, if I pull this trigger, you're dead, you know? And, uh, or maybe she's bluffing. Like she has a trank dart in it, but she's bluffing that it's a real bullet. And she says, I'll put you down. And he, he calls her bluff and then she fires. And, you know, then you have the, oh, that's a very small drop in a large bucket of drugs, which is a great line. And that would be great. And then he takes her down in a non-lethal way because, you know, she's not really a threat to him and he senses that. And so he's not going to gun her down, but he, he has her dead to rights and he's like, oh, I'll sell you to some traveling slavers or something, make a few extra bucks. And you could have a nice little save the cat moment for him as a character right there because he ha he could kill her, but he chooses not to because of interesting elements of his personality, right? And then she's in a bind, and then you bring in the Brotherhood guy. And, and there should be a good reason why th the Brotherhood guy wants to enter. Why, why is he sticking his neck out, right? That just seems like the clunkiest, easiest way to do it. She was about to be gunned down. Oh, and look who just showed up. Oh, that's convenient. So I've just, it's, it's, it's kind of a lazy way of getting at it. Anthony says, why would a Brotherhood of Steel knight defend her? You know, don't Brotherhood of Steel only care about high-tech stuff and hoarding it? Exactly. In fact, in fact, that's actually kind of where I'm get, going with this, Anthony, is like, what if the Brotherhood of Steel said, enough, I'm going to, you know, what if the reason the Brotherhood of Steel guy intervenes is because he intends to confiscate her pit boy? What if that's what it is? Like he's going to confiscate her pit boy and all of her technology and take it back with with him, and so that's why he's saving her skin. I think that would be a more interesting way to get at it. So th there's not now. Is it possible that there's interesting elements like that in it? Possible. I doubt it because I just get the feeling that. This is going to be a paint-by-numbers, plot-driven story like all of these things are. It's going to be mediocre. Um, I don't get the feeling that vault dwellers are by their nature utopians either, though, because because they're sort of act acting like she is this kind of guardian angel. Um, she, she's this kind of hyper-paragon character. And while you can be a paragon character and follow it if you wish to be, I never get the sense from the games that that's where the what the vault dwellers were like from their beginning. So I'm not wild about it, and I like that point, Anthony. Said, I know, sigh. And, and then uh, Storm Crow saying, "My man, this is Amazon." Enough said. Well, I mean, they had Terminal List, uh, which was pretty good, and Reacher is pretty good for the most part. Granted, there's those are based on source material that are novels, and novels really are the only novels based shows are the only shows that are good these days, or I guess graphic novels as well. Well, I guess you could say manga books, book based shows, but only the book based shows where the original author has a lot of control. Fallout is a different thing because it's just based on a world, and you can tell any story you want in that world. and I just think what I just think that what Hollywood types like about Fallout is the irreverent satire. That's the only thing they like. They don't give a shit about anything else. The only thing they like is that it's subverting things. That's what they like about it because the the Fallout story has a big element of lampooning American red scare hyper patriotism. Like that's really what they like about it. It lampoons all that and they think that's fun and hilarious and it's nihilistic and it's like but that's only a sliver of what Fallout is. That's only a that's only a, a slice of what it is. It's like if they made a Bioshock, if they made a Bioshock adaptation, I guarantee you what they would latch on to is, oh, this is a critique about Ayn Randian capitalism. And this is all about how Andrew Ryan is just like Donald Trump. 
And that's basically what they would do. They would make it all about that, and it would be all about skewering uh, capitalism, and that's all it would be. And it's like, but that's not what Bioshock was. Bioshock was a detailed, rich, nuanced exploration of all kinds of ideas from the early 20th century and the fallout of World War II. And it was about, and, and Andrew Ryan is not portrayed as, n he's neither really a good guy or a bad guy. He's kind of a man who is this visionary industrial titan who had all these great aspirations and all these idealistic goals. And he ultimately wound up compromising himself and becoming the very thing he hated, which is a very interesting character study. It's a tragedy, really. Bioshock is a tragedy. It's a story of tragedy. And the second game uh, basically does the same thing with Sophia Lamb, who is an avowed communist, who basically goes on the same tragic journey of becoming the very thing that she claims to hate, right? So, so that's what I'm saying is like they latch onto the thing that Hollywood loves, which is always the same thing. It's always the same thing. It's orange man bad, or it's, uh, you know, uh, pronouns and whatever. It's just, that's what they latch onto. They latch onto the things that they always love, and that's what's so boring. That's what's so boring about it. So that disappoints me. Spam is on. Anthony says facts. Facts. I mean, I wish it weren't. I wish it weren't. Believe me, the day they announce a Mass Effect adaptation, the day they announce a Bioshock adaptation, uh, I'm going to cry. I'm just I'm just going to cry. <laughs> I'm just going to be like as on that rant, just like, <laughs> you've destroyed it all now. I, and... and I don't know how they haven't by now. I really don't, because Mass Effect is such low-hanging fruit, and I just don't know why. There's got to be something in the works somewhere, and, and I don't want there to be, because they will ruin it. They will absolutely... <clears throat> I said this on the last stream. If they adapted Shepard's story... <laughs> I mean, do we even have to say it? We know exactly what gender Shepard would be. With 100% certainty, <laughs> you know? And it's like, never mind that the game data always shows that like something like 60 to, like at least 67 to 70%, I think is the number I heard once, uh, of players play as male shepherd. Which I actually think is kind of a low number given, you know, you would think it would be more like 90%. It's about, it's about in the 70s, 70 percentile play as male shepherd, which is obvious and makes sense. I love Fem Shep. I love Jennifer Hale's performance. That's the reality. So, so smart money would be that they would just go with what players typically would expect, but they won't. They won't. You just know that they won't because they'll want it to be a strong female woman. Never mind that everything is that now. Everything is. You know, uh, <laughs> anyway, there you have it. Swords. <laughs> Sippy cup is worth what this is not a sippy cup, Fu Man Blue. This is not a sippy cup. The, 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 do you see a sippy? <laughs> I should just come on the stream with a juice box, shouldn't I? <laughs> I should have a juice box and like dinobites, you know. You know the little chicken nugget dinobites and just dinobites and uh and ju and a juice box. Uh you didn't blow it. No, Fu Man Blue. That was a great roast. Exactly. Yeah. Juice box, 100%. <clears throat> that, that'll be, that'll show George the Giant Slayer. I've got my straw and my juice box. <laughs> I've got my, my Capri Sun. Uh, speaking of children, speaking of children, uh, would you like to see a sign that we're winning, folks? Would you like to see a sign that we're winning? This is what the sound of losing looks like. Uh, this was a thing which happened. So they had the GDC, which is the Game Developers Conference. And uh, there was a group of game developers who were losing their jobs because uh, the, the, the fox of mediocrity is in the hen house and it is destroying the game industry. You are having consistently bad games with uh, you know terrible releases, buggy gameplay, filled with a bunch of SJW nonsense. And so they're losing. And so what do they do? Do they accept criticism? Do they adopt a professional mindset? No, they decide to go out and scream like children. So, so here you go. 
Here you go. This is this is what this is what the adults. This is what, you know. I say this a lot, right? I go to watch Dune Part Two, and I say this is incredible to watch a film made by adults. Not not to be confused with an adult film. That is a different phenomenon. I'm talking about a film made by mature adult professionals who know what they're doing, right? Why do I describe it that? Well, this is why I describe it this way, because this is the people that are making video games right now. Ah! 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 Oh, Jesus. Ah! Th this is 50 ostensibly adult people who are screaming at the sky because they're losing their jobs. <laughs> because they suck. My God, folks. You know what it makes me think of? It makes me think of my, it's the cancel pigs. The cancel pig sound effect. Where is my cancel pigs? It should be, this is the sound we should be hearing. Yeah, exactly. There you go. It's, uh, they, they are crying at the sky. This is how, this is how left wing wacko loons and just adult, adult children. This is how they handle the fact that their industry is failing and they're the reason it is failing. Well, we're just, we're not getting all of the things that we want, so we're just gonna cry about it. And I just couldn't help but I watched this and I was like, God, the leftist mentality is they are it's such a loser mentality, man. It's such a loser mentality. It's uh it is it is for mediocre people. It is for people who want to blame all of their failures on everyone but them. That is what leftism is for. It is for people that want to blame everything on someone else. It's such a loser mentality, and it's incredible. The more these people lose, the more convinced they are of how right they are. The more that their businesses go under, the more their games don't sell, the more people don't go to see their movies, the more convinced they are that they're right. <laughs> that they are right and that they're fighting the power. It's like, and, the, it's, uh, and that they are being held down and oppressed. And it's and how unfair life is, and I'm just like, oh, fucking losers, man, just losers. <laughs> Re exactly, Stormcrow. Re. By the way, th this is what winning looks like, folks. Their industry, they like that would be AAA games are going down in flames right now. Fu Man Blue says we need a new channel on Discord called Sky Shouting. <laughs> I know, dude, but this phenomenon of going out in public and screaming like a toddler, folks. What has happened to our society? <laughs> I mean, this is, these are the people that want us to go toe to toe with Russia. <laughs> I mean, these are the people that want money to go to Ukraine again. It's like, do you think you're going to win? They, uh, uh, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I'm not taking a side. I'm just saying, you got to get your priorities straight. If this is how you handle adversity in your life, it's like, oh my God. I, this this is why people love shows like Mad Men, you know, and like Boardwalk Empire, because because they, they are shows about back in the days when like men could handle themselves, when they could handle themselves, and they didn't cry about their problems. It's like <laughs> these people think that they think that the way to handle the anyway is to cry about. It. It's pathetic. It's uh, I pity them. I pity them. And I just thought I would share that with you because they are losing badly. So there you go, Stormcrow. Feel better. Feel better. We are taking our culture back piece by piece. Should we do... I, You know, I feel like we should get into the Acolyte trailer because we'll have more on... on uh, we'll have more on that later. But I want to get into the Acolyte trailer because I know, I know, you've probably seen this ad nauseum by now. But... You have not heard what the captain has to say about it. And I promise I will not play this for one minute longer than we have to. But I'm just going to tell you right now, I, I am making a prediction about the Acolyte. And I, I, you know, hold me to this. I am telling you, we after seeing Ahsoka, which I considered the worst show of 2023, uh, after seeing Obi-Wan Kenobi, after seeing, uh, what else have we had? Mandalorian Season 3, Boba Fett, all total disasters complete, absolute, I mean, they might as well just be public humiliations of Dave Filoni and John Favreau. They might as well just be public humiliations. I don't know why those men are not humiliated. I don't know why. I Because I would be humiliated as a creative. <laughs> Actually, 
I mean, it would be embarrassing to produce something so shit. But I feel like I could take it in stride. You know, like Sydney Sweeney, she has a really good, and Dakota Johnson, they have a very professional mindset about their failures. They are on it. They understand that those were failures, and they have a professional workman mindset about it, which I greatly admire and I greatly respect. Dave Filoni and John Favreau, on the other hand, seem to have actually no awareness that what they produced was garbage. And if they do, they don't let on. But in any case, with all those failures, I am predicting that the Acolyte is going to be the worst one of these. I am saying I think the Acolyte is going to be the worst disaster we've seen yet. That's a bold prediction because the bar is low, my friends. Like, Ahsoka is one of the most pathetic things I've ever seen. It's one of the boringest shows that, that had the most potential, the most squandered potential. Boba Fett, Boba Fett was perplexing to me. I was like, why are there two Mandalorian episodes in the middle of Boba Fett? Like, that's the weirdest thing I've ever seen, folks. It's the weirdest thing I've ever seen in a TV show. I was like... This has no relevance to even Boba Fett. Why are we watching The Mandalorian and Grogu? And so, so even with all of that, I'm still telling you, I think The Acolyte's going to be the worst show. And I'm going to explain to you why in just a moment. But first, the captain must take a short break. So do not go away because we have The Acolyte and much more of the captain's cast coming up after this brief break. And we are back. And have I taken a moment today to say, my dear chat, how much I appreciate you being here. I know there's other channels you could be watching. I know that uh, there's a lot of content on YouTube, but you're choosing to spend your Sunday here. And it's a great decision because there's a lot of great content to come. But I appreciate it. And I'm deeply grateful. Tom is in the chat. I was getting my juice box, Tom. <laughs> I was getting my... And uh, Mom said my nuggies were ready, so I had to go get them. Poyo Surf is in the chat. Ahoy, Poyo. Fu Man Blue says, the minute you pissed, you were back to ordinary Joe. I know, that's literally... I just kind of, like, stare at the sky. <laughs> I'm, back to, I'm back to ordinary... I, I know, I'm drinking too much water from my not-sippy cup, Fu Man Blue. That is not a sippy cup. That is a that is an athletic that is an athletic elite athlete training cup. I <laughs> I should just stop trying to defend myself. It's not working out too well. Uh yes. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, Tom is out Tom is in the chat. So good to see you. Fu Man Blue says, anyone ever see Limitless? I have not seen Limitless. I'm just, I don't know. That one never seemed interesting to me. It just didn't. So, and you know, I have, by the way, we are live on Rumble, YouTube, and X, formerly Twitter. If you're enjoying the content, throw a like or a subscribe. Consider it. Um, and, th and let me know in the comments if there's anything you'd like to see uh, the captain cover. 
So, and by the way, Fu Man Blue, I've got to get back on Stargate. I have not forgotten about Stargate. We're going to go back into that soon. I just have been distracted by other things. So, all right, let's get to the Acolyte trailer because, folks, as I said before the short break to get my nuggies and my sippy cup and my juice box, this is going to be the worst disaster yet in Lucas Star Wars. Bold prediction, but it is the captain's prediction. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Your eyes can deceive you. We must not trust them. Tell me what comes into your mind. Life. Th this is such pseudo philosophical bullshit. <laughs> this is just, this is gobbledygook. This is what I mean when I say that trailers now do not tell you anything. They don't, there's no hook. There's no hook for a story, right? Uh, th this is the other thing that bothers me about Disney Star Wars, among many things. Uh, obviously, all the memes on this trailer are appropriate. But one thing I will say is, there is a fundamental misunderstanding that modern writers have of what the actual philosophy of Star Wars is. And that's really my biggest problem is I don't think they understand, like, you know, when I watch the scene where Yoda lifts the X-Wing out of the swamp and, and Luke has that amazing reaction of like, how, I, I don't believe it. And Yoda says, that is why you fail, right? <clears throat> that gives me chills. It gives me chills because he's making such a brilliant philosophical point about the nature of belief and how and what actually powers the force and what it can actually do and how it's, how its limitations have so much less to do with what we than with physical strength you know those are deep philosophical themes and what i think that they do again getting back to what we were talking about storm crow this is not about those philosophical themes this Disney Star Wars and in general, and this show in particular, are referencing Star Wars. They're not about the original ideas of Star Wars. They're just about Star Wars. And they don't seem to understand. They're not adding anything new. And by the way, look at the color palette. This is so boring. Tell me you have not seen this 50 times. This is literally just, it, it looks just like the Maz Kanata setting again. It's just the Maz Kanata bar again. This is so boring to me. This literally could be, this could be any scene in The Mandalorian. This could be any scene in Boba Fett. There's nothing new here. Nothing feels, yeah, anyway. Uh, roll tape. Balance. I see fire. Oh, yeah. Balance. <laughs> I hate this so much. I see balance. Uh. I see fire. I see fire. Someone is killing Jedi. It doesn't make sense. What happened? I sensed darkness. Age of Light, a darkness rises. Uh, generic lines. Chat GPT uh, marketing. The, the, this is the other, someone is killing Jedi. That That is not a hook for a story because a hook for a story would be, <clears throat> a hook for a story would be a, a child losing their entire family, right? To a Sith and be a, a, a Sith killed my family, right? And then someone in the Jedi temple is saying, there's no such thing as the Sith. That's not what happened. That would be a hook for a story. I'm not saying that's a good story. I'm just saying that's a hook for a specific story about a character who is looking for something. There's no sense of that at all in this trailer. And this is what Kurtzman Trek is like. This is what uh, MCU is like. It's all of these things are just superficial bullshit. This isn't about good or bad. This is about power. And who is allowed to use it? 
What is that? Light, he fadered. <laughs> he fadered, dude. No, uh, no. Of course, of course. Uh, look at all the colors. <laughs> look at all the colors. Uh, that's that's all that is. All all gloss, all superficial. Be it's not even glossy garbage because it's honestly it's boring. I've seen that cantina a thousand times. I've seen the 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 Jedi younglings a thousand times. I've said this before. I just I think that there are a lot of really stupid people <laughs> that are writing these shows. I mean, stupid people that cannot write anything original. There's nothing real in that trailer. There's nothing that actually makes me curious about what's going to happen. So yeah, it's awful. It's absolutely awful. Uh, now, I should. Uh, oh, and of course, that line that uh, this is not about right or wrong. This is about power and who's allowed to use it. Again. They, they fundamentally misunderstand what the story of Star Wars is. They fundamentally misunderstand what it was about. And uh, Star Wars is absolutely, it is fucked. It is just so, it is so fucked. It's like, it's never coming back. That, they, oh God, they're going to they're gonna drive this thing. They're going to drive this thing all the way to the bottom. Now, there is a man who performs a service to humanity. His name is Grizzy1989. He is a YouTuber who, unlike your dear captain, he has a strong stomach, and he can wade through all of the shills, the Disney shills that think this is a great trailer. He can go find all of their vapid, grasping arguments and he he clips them out and he organizes them into a museum exhibit to preserve for posterity so that we will never forget we will never forget the shillery our descendants will remember this day and how wrong things were before the dawn lest they repeat the mistakes of the past and so we are going to watch some grizzly shills <laughs> we're gonna watch some grizzly shills defend this crap Hat tip Grizzy 1989. Doing the Lord's work, he is. Um, I, I don't even know what the term acolyte means. <laughs> no, we gotta start that over. <laughs> I've not seen this yet. <laughs> oh my god, you know, I, I, it's like sometimes I'm half joking when I say these are stupid people, but I mean... <laughs> fucking Google it. Like, what are you talking about? Just go Google it. An, an acolyte. But but seriously, who doesn't know what an acolyte is? It's it's a student. That's what the word means. It means student. That's the simple definition. That's what it is. Student or follower. I didn't even have to Google it, but whatever. Whatever. Mm, I, I don't even know what the term acolyte means. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let me get this straight. Leslie Headland. Oh, my God. In the words of Lieutenant Jim Dangle, uh, <clears throat> that, that, is a, uh, that is a very unfortunate-looking woman. That is a very unfortunate-looking woman. That's the ugliest lady I've ever seen. <laughs> Former Harvey Weinstein personal assistant, she gets a Star Wars series on Disney+. Plus. Yeah. All right, well, the trailer just dropped, and the shills are clocked in and ready to go to work. What's up, everyone? The Acolyte trailer is out. We're gonna get ready to watch it, react to it for the first time. Making their shills re She has a shirt already? <laughs> what? You, you haven't even seen it. You haven't even seen a trailer that even gives you a hint of what it's about. We that that's such a great point. I've heard about this too. Nothing in that trailer indicates the time or place. Do you notice that? Nothing in the trailer indicates where or when we are in the Star Wars universe. It's completely disorienting. So she she has no idea what it's about. She has no idea who who's even the main character. Is there a main character in that trailer? Is it the kids? No. Is it the teacher? No, because they they keep shifting to a different character at every shot. So it's like, who's even this? Who is this about? Why have we lost this ability in storytelling to tell a? You know, it's like it's Ghostbusters Frozen Empire. It's the same problem. Why are we telling a story about fifty characters that are all duplicates of each other? 
The original Ghostbusters was three crackpot scientists who go into business busting ghosts. That's all you need for a good story. Why are we, you know, so, so why can't we tell a story about a specific character or, or tight, tightly knit group of characters? React debut on the channel. Star Wars cross-dressing explained. Oh my, what, what, <laughs> what, what, what is this? <laughs> what in the actual frack? <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Jeez, you know, I'm not kidding you when I tell you that Grizzy is doing something, folks. I couldn't do it because the shells, they make me sick. And his whore wife. Uh, oh, I've been Chrissy. so excited for this series. So what you need is some chapstick and a set of trousers. I am so excited. I am so excited for this show. I can't wait. I'm just so excited. I'm just so excited. <laughs> Don't be your one on the phone. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> he finds these clips. <laughs> Close your eyes. Oh my god. Your eyes. Oh, for fuck's sake. I'm deceiving you. The way you are looking at these children, sir, I might need you to take a seat. <laughs> so damn sure. Oh my gosh. Freaks me the f out. I love seeing the young ones. D Dude! <laughs> what the? WTF, man? <laughs> I, I know. It's, I, I love seeing the young ones. Oh. <laughs> mm, I mean, listen. Chat, honest to God, I really do give the most of these shills the benefit of the doubt that they that these are genuine reactions. I know that might be fake. It probably is. I'm just saying it's my personal ethic. I give them the benefit of the doubt. But when I hear a reaction like this, this cannot be real. I see fire. Oh. I see. F What's interesting about that? <laughs> what does that even mean? What do you? I see fire. That's that's the that's the name of an Ed Sheeran song from the Hobbit trilogy. Who cares? Uh, Fu Man Blue says a little crossroads deal talk here. Yes, uh, follower adherent. Yes, the, everyone in this chat knows what an acolyte is. <laughs> you know, that's so stupid. She's like, I don't know what an acolyte is. Freaking Google it. It's not that hard. Go go look it up. Acoly Who doesn't know what an acolyte is? Just anyway, uh, stop here. He says, Leslie Headland looks like a linebacker. Her head looks like a helmet and she has the shoulder pads already. Uh, yes. Uh, I call a flag on the acolyte play. <laughs> Just be very careful with Star Fury's chats here. Uh, mm -hmm. mm, yes, yes. Yes, a good one, Stafiori, says Fu Man Blue, and he is correct. Uh, roll tape. It's funny with React content that anytime these people see something that they recognize, be it a person, an actor, a place, or an item, they gotta scream out what it is. Whoa! Oh my gosh, dude, the Jabba entrance, I love it. Carrie Ann Moss? I got Trinity up in here, and she's a Jedi! Come on, Carrie Ann Moss. Wookie! Trinity! <laughs> Lightsaber. Don't hold lightsabers. <laughs> Yo, oh my god, I, I, I think it's Noah doing another uh, Chewbacca, no, another Wookie. Look at all the Jedi! Vernestra Rowe! I don't know if that was Vernestra Rowe or not. I don't know! You will never get laid. <laughs> Neither oh will. my god. <laughs> Look, 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 there's nothing wrong with some childlike wonder. There's nothing wrong with uh, collecting comic books and, you know, having fun. There is something wrong with an adult man, <laughs> you know, that's that's reacting this way, okay? Blade. <laughs> Neither will you. Yo, let's go. <laughs> let's go, mate. Let's do this. It doesn't oh, make sense. Oh, 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 oh. Let's go. How do you Let's do it, Grizzy? What is that? How do you do it? That's a red blade. Red? Oh, oh my god, the color obsession. Oh my god. They they do this every time. I was I was joking when I said, oh look, all the colors, all the colors of the lightsaber. Did they they literally are just they're like Paplov's dog. They're like Paplov's dog. They are trained to salivate 
when they see colors <laughs> of lightsabers. They, oh, 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 oh color, colorful lightsaber. Oh, oh, oh. That's red. Oh, somebody just threw the red lightsaber. Well, I'm glad you're here to tell us these things. But I don't know who threw the red lightsaber. Uh, whoever that may be is um, pretty dope. Well, this is Disney Star Wars, so you can pretty much guarantee that it's a woman. Carrie Ann Moss, Jody Turner Smith, Daphne Keene, and Amanda Steinberg. Let's go, man. Amanda Steinberg. It's a woman. This is Carrie my, Ann Moss. This is my favorite shill. <laughs> this is my favorite shill because he's the one that accidentally reacted honestly <laughs> to, to, to the crap Ahsoka show. When uh, when Sabine tried to hand Ezra his lightsaber, you know, and he refuses it, this was the guy that was like, what, what, wait, what? Oh, I, I, I mean, really good. <laughs> but for just a brief moment, for just a brief moment, he just, he became... He became a normal, <laughs> a normal reaction, a normal, honest reaction. And uh, I, I appreciate that about him. Us, Jody Turner Smith, Daphne Keene, and Amanda Steinberg. Let's go, man. I think it's the first one. I clapped. I clapped when I saw it. There you go. That's more like it. Let's go. Oh, that only did I. Oh. oh. What the fuck is wrong with you? Oh my god. So Dude, that 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 guy has given me the kind of energy of like all the idiots that uh, the GDC that were all screaming at the sky. That would be that guy. You know, just screaming at the sky. Any lightsabers. That's so fucking cool. Ah! Oh. <laughs> Holy shit, man. Oh, this looks so good. Hell yeah, man. Let's freaking go. Whoa! You really need to practice your show face. <laughs> One ugly motherfucker. <laughs> you need to practice your show face. I don't want to cry right now. I'm just so heavy. <laughs> Frick! This is a big if, but if this woman's reactions are indeed genuine, I really think she should check herself into an institution. Um, oh my god. Ah, 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 frick. Oh my god. Oh my sweet. Oh, oh my goodness gracious. Um, okay. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Just, this is, this is, this. You have to commit me. I'm here for it. Listen, this looks like so. Oh, it's, it's not Gobbler. It's not Gobbler. <laughs> That's Chrissy's nickname for her. Wars, man this looks like like star wars and why do you think that nut gobbler this looks <laughs> insane uh all those lightsabers together thanks for watching and if you enjoyed the video <laughs> thank you grizzy a scholar a chair a champion a champion of humanity that is grizzy where is my applause mr producer Give him a like, give him a follow. He live streams now. Grizzy live streams. He's great. <laughs> they were having quite the debate about Nut Gobbler on his live stream. Sippy Cup. I have to get all my caffeine in. I have to get... I The captain is properly caffeinated today. I'll tell you something. That shield <laughs> that was like... <clears throat> Wow! Wow! Dad, what? <laughs> like, what did you see? Please fill me in. What did you see in that trailer that I see fire? Oh my God! He see he sees fire. It's like freaking Grace Randolph over here. I don't know. I don't like Star Wars. I really hate it. But I like that he sees fire. Okay. <laughs> they, they don't. They. This is you know. One of the shills, he had that shirt that said, kindness, pass it on. And it's like, you know, it just, it bugs me, folks, because, yes, I agree. I agree we should all be kind and we should all be, we should all be kind to one another. I do not consider supporting, yeah, support what you want, but I do not personally consider supporting mediocre to bad to uh, embarrassing to awful. 
awful. Writing, storytelling, directing, acting. I do not consider supporting that to be a good thing. I do not consider that to be kindness. I consider that to be uh, supporting supporting bad storytelling. And what is the problem with bad storytelling? Well, it's always going to exist. It always has existed. And art, you know, you wouldn't have the good without the bad. So I'm not saying you can ever get to a place where we don't have it, but we should be, we should be demanding something better. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, look at all the colors. It's like, well, okay, but don't you want a story? Don't you want to, you know, oh, I don't know who threw that red lightsaber. I guarantee you, whoever it is, it's going to be lame. It's going to be freaking lit. These are the same kinds of reactions that they had about Thrawn. These are the same kinds of reactions they had about Moff Gideon. And every single time, this is an uh, Balin, you know, every single time, it's a total letdown. There's no character development. There's no real story. There's no clear objective. <clears throat> and they just move on to the next thing. Well, I don't consider that a kindness to anyone. It's not a kindness to the professionals because these professionals, they're, I use that term loosely, the professionals that are making this content are failing at what they do. And these these shills, and they're entitled to have this opinion, but they are they are misleading them with these. I mean, Dave Filoni said that, or no, was it Dave Filoni or John Favreau? I can't remember. Which, I think it was Favreau who said that he just loved seeing all the happy reactions to The Mandalorian Season 3. And it's like, that's not a kindness. That's not a kindness because The Mandalorian Season 3 was awful. And somebody should have been, he should have had... He should have heard the actual critique. I don't know. That's just my thoughts on it. But the chat has, the chat must have their say. Shout out to Grizzy, says Fu Man Blue. And right you are, Fu Man Blue. A captain should have a tankard on a dry gullet. And I agree. I agree, Fu Man Blue. Stop here. He says, I didn't see anyone kicked in the balls. Instant cancellation. <laughs> Someone's getting kicked in the balls in the acolyte. I just think, I definitely think so. Fu Man Blue says, uh, maybe a water skin in a certain situation. Perhaps. That's right. If Tim Allen were here, we'd have he'd have a tankard for the captain. Tim Allen, uh, a mead man, if there ever was one. The chat. You are amusing me today, chat. I love it. So yeah, that that is Grizzy. <laughs> he does it. like dude, I love this meme by the way. You got to see this. This this is the there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. This might be my favorite for the acolyte. Here we go. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> In an age of light, a darkness slides. <laughs> Star Wars the bag of shite. <laughs> oh, they, they really screwed up with that poster. That poster is so bad. Oh, my God. They absolutely blew it with that. Oh, my... You know, I just... <clears throat> I'm going to watch The Acolyte because I must con I must confirm whether I'm correct that this is going to be the worst one of these. Uh, I I'm getting a little more I'm getting a little more choosy about how many <laughs> how many brain cells I'm willing to kill <laughs> to watch these things. I mean, I don't I, I get to the point where it's like, you know, I think when I started out with this channel uh, doing it about a little over a year ago. I kind of had it in mind that I was going to do like, you know, there'd be a bad show one week and a good show the next week and maybe a good movie and then a bad movie. And I, and my vision was that I would I would sort of like I would I would there would be balance. I would see balance. There would be balance, you know, the good over here, the bad over there. And then it's like I watch I watch Mandalorian season three and then Secret Invasion and then Ahsoka and it just goes on and on and then Echo and I'm just like, oh my God, there's nothing. Oh my God, they've destroyed everything. Every single one of these things. <laughs> I'm like, that takes a toll, folks. That takes a real toll, man. <laughs> I'm like, I'm just so, so I, I've saved, I've saved a few brain cells for Acolyte, but I, I mean, I'm not going to do every Disney thing this year. I'm just not, I can't do, like, I didn't do Loki 2. I watched like the first, I literally got 10 minutes into Loki 2 and I'm like, screw this. I can't do this. Like, I cannot do this. And I'll tell you the thing about Loki 2 that, that, that I hate the most is that, 
<clears throat> it it kind of has that it has that quality that, that Kurtzman Trek sometimes has, which is they'll they'll show you something that you kind of like, like Tribbles or something, or or like a a, a classic Romulan warbird from like the old Kirk era, but they'll show it in like modern CGI and it looks super cool. And but you know that there's no substance and you know that it's not going anywhere. And they do this all the time. And so so the problem with the the problem with continuing past that point, you know, like with Loki, it's like, oh, I see that we have Tom Hiddleston and he seems pretty interesting. It's like, I know that what's going to happen is they're going to string you along for like four or five episodes. Nothing's really going to happen. They're going to grind you down. Then they're going to try and hook you with like, oh, but here comes the big final battle between Loki and the big bad. And then it turns out to be a nothing burger at the end. And then you get to the end of eight hours and you realize you wasted eight hours. You realize you wasted eight hours hoping, hoping that something was that this is why, like, I can't I just I can only take so many stuff, Yuri, with a two pounds sterling. <clears throat> With a two pound sterling, says for the whiskey fun to get you through acolyte. Well, thank you, Star Fury. That is very generous of you, sir. I shall do my best. <laughs> Star Fury. It's only bad shows. You know, I I I long for good shows again. I really, you know, I was enjoying the hell out of Invincible, but like it they it just stopped after four episodes. I don't know whether that was the writer strike or what. And then uh Tulsa King, that was fantastic. That won't come back. And I'm like, I'm just, I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated that when there is something good, it seems to just drop off into a void and you don't get any more. Popular colonizer currency. I know, I know. But, I, you know, it's the finest. The finest colonizer currency. And, uh, and I'm here for it. Redoubt Productions is in the chat. Says, enjoy Shogun while we have it. I, I intend to. That last episode was pretty fantastic. Um, I love John Blackthorne. He is such a great character. He's so much fun. And uh, I, I love when he kind of reaches his wits end in this last episode. And he's like, he's like, I respectfully request to return to England. And they're like, why do you want to go back to England? He's like, because I'm tired of your whole damn country, trapped in your rituals and uh, the cheapness of life and all that. And he just goes on this big rant. It was fantastic. It was, uh, it was fantastic. Really great show. And we and uh I will do my best, Redoubt, this week. We'll if you're down for it, we'll do another review this week if you're up for it. And uh we'll keep watching it. Stop here, he says, we are planning recolonization. We're just taking a breather. <laughs> yeah, I bet you are, Stop Fury. I bet you are. In fact, in fact. <laughs> uh <laughs> I'm pulling something up just for you, just for you, Star Fury, because when you recolonize, I know exactly what it's going to look like. I know exactly what's going to happen. Here it is, chat. <laughs> Hang on. It's a one bad show here, folks. <laughs> there it is. Star Fury, this is when they come back. <laughs> the rebel Americans know of our attack? How? Fire at will! <laughs> <laughs> That's how to look. So we're, we're ready for you, Star Fury. <laughs> uh, what, what did I... I think... Uh, tea at the White House. What? I... I used to think that that was just a meme that the British are obsessed with tea, but you really are. You re I, I think it's kind of wonderful, but I also don't get it at all. <laughs> like, that's such a... They really love tea. We used to in America, but then we threw it all in the harbor and we were like, screw that. We're not doing that anymore. Uh, it used to be important in America, too. But uh, then we, we discovered tobacco. And tobacco was way better than tea. So there you have it. Uh, what else do we have here? What else is in the stack of stuff? How am I doing on... I'm just making sure I'm not getting, like, any warning. I played a lot of trailers today. Uh, but, you know, actually, Amazon and Disney are pretty good about that, so they, they deserve some credit there. Oh, yes! Yes, we have we have House of the Dragon, and we have Alien Romulus. We have lots of trailers to get to, so... I actually probably have too many trailers. 
where should we go next? I want to see Alien Romulus because uh, I so I had re- I had reviewed a trailer that was like a fake. Tra- I kind of suspected it was because I was like, this can't be real. So I'm like, where did this come from? But I don't know why there was this fake fan made trailer that was out there. But anyway, this is now an official trailer. Oh, by the way, the uh, the ratio is is glorious on that Acolyte trailer. What was the ratio on that? What's it up to? Acolyte trailer. Uh, this is on the it's it's ratioed on every single channel that it's posted on. Uh, this is the one. Dude, some of these com- these comments are just brilliant. Yeah, uh 175,000 upvotes to 482,000 downvotes on the Acolyte trailer. Oh, <laughs> that is magnificent. That is magnificent. Dude, this one is... I, the fans, I think the real fans, have had it. Like, they have had it. Like, it is... It is. We have had... You know, you... It is pretty remarkable when you think about it that every single Star Wars show since Mandy, since really Boba Fett, every single thing they've come out with since Boba Fett has been a total disaster. I guess Andor might be the only exception, but... You know, it's... They've had it. They've really hit their wits end with it. And you've got all of these great comments like, close your eyes, what do you see? The like-dislike bar looks like a lightsaber. (laughs) It's like, uh, uh, close your eyes, what do you see? The message. It's They're getting absolutely roasted. But um, in any case, let us do Romulus. I love how Star Fury and Redoubt are they're having a gentleman's disagreement about the British odds when they come back to recolonize. <laughs> that that's definitely Definitely good member berries there. The the little the distinctive alarm sound from the Nostromo. Run. Well, this definitely looks a hell of a lot better <laughs> than, than that fake trailer that I saw a while ago. But uh, let me just make sure I'm not getting any warnings here. Um, <clears throat> well, this is only a teaser. Now, now in a teaser, it's totally acceptable to not reveal the story in a teaser. That's fine. If it's just a teaser, the very first look, that's fine. And there's a lot of trailers that do that. The problem I have is that now the full trailers are like teasers that don't, uh, that someone is killing Jedi. That's the story. Enjoy. Okay, fine. Uh, let, let's let it run a little further. I mean, that was rad. That was pretty rad. I mean, I do like how, like, rapid fire, like, how, how frighteningly fast the, uh, the, the face huggers look. Like, that was pretty cool. <sighs> uh... Yeah. Uh... How could I put this? <laughs> I'm trying to figure out a way to put this. Um. Obviously, obviously, in a world where you can almost never make a franchise that that either originally had a male protagonist or could have a male protagonist, you can never make it with a male protagonist. In that world, remaking a show in which there was originally a female protagonist, well, that that's just right out. That's just, you can definitely never, you can just never have a originally female protagonist series then led by a male. So that's never going to happen. Okay, fine. And honestly, I wouldn't expect that. I just wouldn't. But do you have to go and find uh, the most unfortunate looking women? <laughs> like, do you do you really do you really have to? Why do they go and find these women that have no charm, no personality? Why? I mean, they're just unremarkable. 
just unremarkable actors that are not it. Why don't you get, go get Sydney Sweeney for this? Why don't you go get Sydney Sweeney for this? I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, that, there's nothing there that gets me excited, honestly. Uh, the face hugger looked cool, but like, listen, this is the deal. I love the Alien franchise. I love the Aliens world. And um, I think that the basic the basic premise of the trailer is fine because, you know, it looks like the old ships. It's about, it's monster in the house, you know, body horror, that kind of stuff. That's all great. That's all fine. I have no issue with that. But that's all surface detail. Am I really going to be invested in these characters? Am I really going to want to follow these characters through the story? And also, is this a show or a movie? I got to I got to read the description because I'm honestly not clear. The sci fi horror thriller takes the phenomenally successful Alien franchise back to its roots. While scavenging the deep ends of a derelict space station, a group of young space colonizers come face to face with the most terrifying life form in the universe. The film stars. Kaylee Spanny from Priscilla and David Johnson from Agatha Christie's Murder is Easy. Blah, blah, blah. Who cares? Uh, screenplay. Man, uh, David. Man. Alien Romulus is produced by Ridley Scott, who, who, you know, Ridley Scott, who clearly is not the man he used to be. He's not the talent he used to be. Who directed the original Alien and the series Prometheus. But is it a show or a movie? It's completely unclear. I think it's supposed to be a film. I think it's what it's supposed to be. Alien, Ron. Okay, it's a film. Got it. All right. Thank you, IMDb. It's a film. All right, fine. Is it supposed to take place in the Ridley verse with all the, with the weird aliens he created for Prometheus? I hope not. I really hope not. Basic monster in the house story should should be pretty easy not to screw it up. Should be pretty easy not to screw it up, but you know my my opinion of uh, Hollywood has taken quite the hit of late. So I'll believe it when I see it. They can't make anything original. They're, they're you know what they're just going to be doing. They're just going to be referencing Alien. That's all they're going to be doing. It's just going to be a movie. It's going to be a cover band of Alien. That's all it is. It's a, every movie now is a cover band of another movie. That's all it is. Because they have no original, co they have no original ideas. It's all cult. It's the corporate algorithm wood chipper. So let's watch something that is not in the corporate algorithm wood chipper. Uh, let's watch something that I am extremely excited for, and that would be House of the Dragon. House of the Dragon, and we have two trailers for House of the Dragon: one for the greens and one for the blacks. Wait, no, 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 don't clip that, Twitter. No, no. I'm saying in the world of Game of Thrones. Oh, no. This is such an unfortunate nomenclature. This is a very unfortunate nomenclature here. All right, here we go. Many weeks ago, my lord husband was alive. And the realm was at peace. On his deathbed, he knew the realm would never accept the queen. I really love Allison's character. She has become such a a interesting, complex character. I love the I love the strange moral paradoxes that she finds herself in in this show. Rhaenyra's supporters will believe what they wish, but Viserys wanted her gone to succeed him. They wish now not for the good of the realm, but for the satisfaction of vengeance. Not against the king, and I will pay it back a hundred times over. I'm as fearsome as any of them. You have no idea the sacrifices that were made to put you on that throne. My uncle is a challenge I want. If he does. Dude, dude, this is one of my favorite characters right here. And uh, his name totally escapes me. It's something with a Y in it. I'm pretty sure about that. Oh, Eye patch kid. What's his name, chat? Does anyone remember? <laughs> that's that's mean. Actually, that's actually kind of mean. Who who can even remember? Uh, let's see. Because Aegon is the is his brother. Man, uh, is it Amond? That's Amond. 
Dude, this is why I cannot remember any of the names of the show. It's Amont and Aegon and Viserys and Valerian and I'm just Reyna and Rhaenyra. I'm just I can't these all the names sound the same in this show. They all sound that <laughs> I know Star Fury. I, I didn't I meant I meant Team Black in the show, Game of House of the Dragon. That's what I meant. <laughs> no, so this is Amond, a uh, fantastic character and uh, really well portrayed by the actor here, which is uh, Ewan Mitchell. So if it, if it, I, this, this character could put the captain on team green. I'm just saying could put the captain on team green, but uh, we'll let the trailer play. Face me. We will prevail and bring forth peace. And I love Otto Hightower. I love Otto Hightower. He's a fantastic character. But you must accept that the path to victory now is one of violence. Good. To war, then. All my life, I've endeavored to serve both my house and the realm. Uh-oh, uh-oh. I'm getting a warning. All right. I think I've reached the limit. I've reached the limit of the what let's see. Hang on a second. Uh yeah, it's funny because they didn't really hit a lot of other channels that were playing it. So that's the Greens trailer. It's pretty good. I'm probably gonna have to leave it there because I'm getting a warning. So the captain has stretched YouTube's patience to the limit. Well, we tried, chat. But anyway, uh, yeah, the black trailer. I'll just give you a, a, I'll just give you a spoiler. It's better. The black trailer is better. But uh, <laughs> what are you doing to me? What are you doing to me, George? I just, you know. But in any case, um, yeah, definitely. At at the end of the day, I'm Team Black because because of uh, Damon Targaryen. He's just such a great character. He's so and also. I think that I think the biggest reason I'm Team Black is because I love Viserys Viserys's character, the King. You know, he was he really is honestly the best part of season one. He is, and you you he comes out of nowhere for me because I was much more interested in Damon and Otto Hightower in the beginning of the season. By the end of the season, I'm like, wow, Viserys has this incredible, incredible character arc. Um, and I, it's such a, it's, it just tears your heart out. The tragedy that he wanted so badly to keep the kingdom from bloodshed. And he almost did. He got this close. He got this close to putting everything right. And just he, in his fever dream, he just accidentally said something that Allison misinterpreted and it just unraveled everything he had done. And it's just, it's brilliant. It's really great. It's really great storytelling. And, uh, I just, I love the fact that Viserys truly wanted Rhaenyra on the throne is kind of why I'm rooting for Team Black. Cause I just like, I want, you know, but, but honestly, <laughs> oh, gee, oh, Star Fury. <laughs> no, no, that's Star Fury. <laughs> are you so... uh... <laughs> oh, jeez. Jeez, chat. Uh... <laughs> And uh, Redoubt, yes, you're right about Alien Romulus. It's a movie. Yeah. Yeah, let's see here. Uh, more. In Hang on a second. I got to check on something. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, that's giving me a warning. Okay, good. That should be fine now. All right. I have, I have relinquished it, YouTube. I have relinquished. I have relinquished playing the video. Uh, what sh where shall we go next? You know, it's funny. I was, uh, I was do I had my reaction to Eric July criticism a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, there was a comment or one of my videos saying that Eric July had an enemies list, had an enemies list. And my response to that was, well, so do I, my enemies are totalitarians, you know, but, but that implied that I was agreeing that Eric July had an enemies list. And I actually do, I actually do owe him a correction for that because, I actually didn't necessarily believe he did or didn't, and I should have made that more clear. But he actually had an interesting post on his channel. I thought I would pull it up as a quick clarification. Um, let me share my screen here. 
That you are, Star Fury. All six-year-olds. And the captain, the captain is very disappointed. Not really. <laughs> um, so, so this is what I mean when I say that Eric July gets this just ridiculous, this ridiculous hate all the time. All the time he's dealing with this. So he has this post on his YouTube, which is a repost of something on Twitter. And he was responding to this guy who was saying Eric used CG for his own self-interest. And when we pointed out his defections, he tried to burn us to the ground. I, for one, can't wait to return the favor. And uh, just this weirdo past Masterton at, da at Magic Beard or whatever, at Dan Magic Beard. Okay, whatever. Eric July responds and says, this is unfortunate. I've never said anything negative about CG. It is disappointing that you're on a one-sided warpath, though you've made it clear of your intention to, quote, burn myself and my company to the ground. I will not engage. We have no enemies. I hope you all find peace. Well, that's a pretty classy response, I have to say, on Eric's part. So I stand corrected. The captain stands corrected. Eric July doesn't have an enemies list, or at least his company doesn't. Uh, if, and uh, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't blame him if he did. But he definitely has enemies, whether he's got an enemies list or not. He's got enemies. But that's what I mean. It's like uh, you know, uh, in the in the in the Barbary Wars, right there, you had these pirates that were attacking American shipping and enslaving our sailors and doing all this stuff. And at the time, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson were ambassadors. And they spoke to the ambassadors from the Barbary pirate states. That would be modern day Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, and uh, Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, and Libya. Those four modern countries, which uh, they were basically pirate kingdoms at that time. And the ambassador from the Barbary states, you know, John Adams was trying to explain to the ambassador, you know, the United States of America is does not consider itself in a state of war with anyone. It considers itself a friend to all countries. That is our default state unless we are provoked or attacked. You know, unless you're you're literally attacking us, we can you're a friend and we want to trade peacefully with you. And the ambassador from the Barbary state basically said, "Well, that's not how this works." Uh we, we have every right. You are infidels, and we have every right to attack you. And so, no, we are in a state of war with you until you um, pay us tribute and earn the right to have peace from us, which is like the complete opposite. It's like that's that's just the difference. It's like sometimes you don't want enemies, but you have them anyway, and there's nothing you can do about it, and you can make a choice to defend yourself or not. And the way I see it is Eric July defends himself. So there you go. Yeah, exactly. Because crazy people, Fu Man Blue. That stuff you ain't no. There is that is there is no need for that. You do not sit in the corner with a dunce cap on. Never stuff here. Never. That, I mean, that's not the kind of punishment that you would get on a ship <laughs> on a ship of war. Yeah, no one gets a dunce cap on a on a proper vessel of war. Vessel of war is what we are. Now. Uh, in case you don't know, I am organizing a uh, Fallout RPG game, and I want to stream it live on this channel. And uh, I've got a few players already. I think Tom is going to play. I think Stoff... Uh, wait, no, I almost said Stoff here. Right? <laughs> that would be speaking out of turn. Uh, Stormcrow is going to play, and uh, Fu Man Blue, maybe? Um, but uh, if you'd like to play in the Discord, reach out to me. Let me know. And uh, I'm working on the campaign now. My goal is to actually, I hope, to have something. It, I hope to have it starting at least very soon, uh, close to the time when the Fallout show debuts. Because I want to, you know, they're going to drop all the episodes at once on the Fallout show, which kind of sucks because I had planned to kind of have my episodes timed along with the show. But uh, whatever, uh, we'll just roll with it going to be a golden fleece it's going to be a golden fleece campaign so uh you're going to like it there's going to be a primal uh prize that the that the players are looking for so it's going to be fun and it it is and so to answer your question storm crow it's going to be about going to the roots of what fallout is and the fun of that world and complex moral choices uh 
Okay, yes. All right, Fu Man Blue. I it's my fault. I I know you you answered me and I just I f- probably forgot. I just forgot which way you voted on that. So, all right, cool. So Fu Man Blue is in. Fu Man Blue's playing. All right, we're going to have a good time. Um and so probably what I'll do is uh reach out on Discord and we'll set up like uh, a chat once I'm ready to do character creation. We're going to do it's going to be Fate RPG rules. But I'm going to use the elements of the Fallout RPG universe. So like armor, weapons, skills, perks, all that kind of stuff. And it's going to be awesome. So as long as the game allows for breaks to scream at the sky twice a day. Yes, yes, Fu Man Blue. Of course, every adult <laughs> mature man must have an opportunity to scream like a baby when he doesn't get what he wants. So... <laughs> That, isn't it a bit? These are the people that call us man babies. These are the people that call us toxic fans. The people that go out in public and scream at the sky when they don't get what they want. Talk about projection, man. Talk about projection. Isn't that incredible? That you know, it's it's so funny because I will I will give left left wing uh, wackos SJW wackos. I will give them credit. They are so good at like revert. It's like presenting the exact reverse opposite of actual reality. You know, they're so good at it. You don't even catch it always. You know, like the same people that want to go online and talk about man babies and male fragility and all that stupid shit are the same people that are crying at the sky. It's unbelievable, man. Anyway, so so what I set up in the Discord link is in the description, by the way. Um, I set up a channel called Fallout RPG, and it's open to everyone. You want to join in, um, and that's going to be our channel to talk about the Fallout RPG, and we'll do like some uh, character planning and stuff like that. And I might, I, I think I can make that a voice channel too. So I'll probably do that. Um, Stone Crows out there says, "Awesome." Um, let's see. Would love to discuss this in voice chat to better pitch it to you guys, says Stormcrow. Talking about your uh, RPG as well. Yes, we'll have to get that organized. So um, I'll be working on some stuff this week, and we'll get that going. We do have a we have a voice chat over there in the vo- the general channel is a voice channel. So we'll figure it out, Stormcrow. Uh, Stormcrow says. I'm a role player, uh, so give me cool NPCs to role play with and romance as well. I'll bring my A game to force. I love it. I love it. I always do it like, yeah, it's, you know, tabletop RPGs, they're awesome because it's like, it. you know, now they're not as open world as like a Bethesda game because you have to kind of, you know, there's only so much a, a GM can plan in advance, but it is pretty open in terms of what you can do. And I like to have complex moral choices as well, so... I, I think that, like, one of the great elements of Fallout is the factions. Like, there's always factions that have, they have sort of good things about them, and they have sort of bad things about them. Nobody's a perfect choice. Like, the, like the Brotherhood of Steel seem very heroic, and they seem like they're on a mission to save humanity, but they also have, they're also quasi-genocidal, you know, towards mutants and all that stuff. So it's like, eh. But then, you, you know, you've got... Um, You've got the Institute, which are kind of rebuilding all this great technology, and they have a plan to save humanity and revitalize the wasteland, uh, but also they've created uh, synthetic robots that they're they're abducting people and replacing them with fakes. It's like, so you've got all of these factions that always have, like, baggage. They And I think that's so brilliant because it, it gives you so much complexity and it forces you as the player to kind of choose who you truly most align with morally. And I have great fun with that in the Fallout games. All right, what else we got in the stack of stuff? Um, I like to talk a lot about amateur mindset versus professional mindset. And uh, I I meant to mention this on the last live stream. Um, and I totally forgot about it. And I just, it was because I just got buried in all the other topics. But here it is. Um, Sydney Sweeney. My dear sailors and star knots, Sydney Sweeney is a professional, is a professional. Now, what is a professional and what is an amateur? Well, um, in the Stephen Pressfield way of looking at approaching art, and that would be Stephen Pressfield of the book, The War of Art, he defines, he defines 
a professional, as someone who has a healthy distance from their work. Now, what does that mean? That means that someone who understands that their work as an artist is not their identity, right? Madonna is not walking around her house in, uh, you know, in elaborate rock star dress with like, you know, nine inch, you know, heels and stuff like that. She's not doing that stuff. Madonna is a character that she's employing as part of her persona, right? So that's kind of what he's saying. He says, now an amateur is someone who identifies totally with their art. And this is why amateurs often, uh, this is like Rachel Zegler, right? She has an amateur mindset. If I have to stand here in this dress in the hot sun, I deserve to be paid. So it's always interesting to note when you get a professional mindset because most of the actors that we see that are bagging on fans and they're very thin-skinned, well, they're exhibiting an amateur mindset. They have an unhealthy attitude and relationship with their work, and so they're unable to take criticism. So here we have uh, Sydney Sweeney. This from CBR. Make sure I'm sharing my screen. Okay, good. Quote, I am so thankful Sydney Sweeney has no regrets about Madam Web. Sydney Sweeney explains why she wouldn't take back starring in Madam Web despite its negative reception. Now, she has a golden opportunity here to throw fans under the bus and say, well, they're toxic and they're male and they're mean. But she did not do that. Madam Web did not draw the reception that was hoped for, but Sydney Sweeney wouldn't take back her involvement. Serving as a part of Sony Spider-Man's universe, Madam Web was not a hit. When it was released in February, it underperformed in the box office. Uh, it bombed. It bombed. Where Where is her quote? They're, oh, my God. These ads are absolutely ridiculous. Um, so she was asked. Actually, I think I could just play this. I do. I have a lot. Yeah, here it so is. So is there point out and the the timeline of projects and explain a few things. So she was just asked about, do you regret being in Madam Web, right? And this is what she says. So don't laugh at that. You guys, come on. By the way, Star Fury would not allow her to play Dungeons and Dragons with us. I just thought I would point that out. Madam Web is my first ever studio project, studio film that I ever got cast in. And I am so thankful to Sony because it was such a building block for me. And while I was filming that, I was actually building the packages for both Immaculate and Anyone But You. And I then took Anyone But You out once I put the whole package together and put the pitch together. And I called up Sony and I said, hey, I have this movie. We're filming together. Let's build a relationship. And that's how anyone but you got made. And I would never have been able to do that without Madam Web. Yeah. You know, that is a brilliant answer. And I'll tell you exactly the most brilliant part of that answer is um, I am so thankful. I am so thankful. Like having gratitude about where she's at. It's like what's so in uh, in the war of arts Stephen Pressfield tells the story about how his first real his first real studio sale of a script was this movie King Kong Lives and it starred Linda Hamilton aka Sarah Connor and it, and it was a dopey King Kong sequel in like the 80s and uh Pressfield thought it was going to be brilliant he thought it was going to be this great movie and he he rented out this whole theater for the premiere and he got all his friends and family and everybody he knew and uh, the, he just packed the theater. And as he puts it, when the they, they watched the movie in mute stupefaction, and the minute the lights came up, they fled like cockroaches into the night. It was terrible. It got panned. The critics hated it. And he was despondent for a while. And he talked to um, a, a mentor of his, and he just said, yeah, I, I, I blew it. This is awful. This is a total disaster. And his mentor said, well, what are you crying about? He's like, what do you mean? He's like, well, you wanted to be in the business, didn't you? You're in the business. Yes, it was a failure, but think about it. You've had your first real failure. That means you're in the game now, and it's time to write the next one. You know, it's time to just move on. And uh, and that was his kind of lesson about having a professional mindset. And so what Sydney Sweeney is recognizing there is that that failure 
also represents the fact that it opened up other opportunities. And she's a brilliant businesswoman. You can tell that because she was using that opportunity to network and make other opportunities. So she is discussing her work. Her work as an actor and uh, and she's discussing like how this helped her in her work. And she is not looking at it as, oh, they don't like me. It's So she has this, she's not blaming the fans and she's not even blaming the studio, which is pretty remarkable. She managed to give an answer that neither blames fans or the studio for the failure. She just indicates, and she had another great quote too, which is, um, hey, it was a movie. I showed up. I did my best. That was out of my control. It's like, that's a professional mindset. So so what's so interesting about the Madam Web thing is that while the film was a failure and it was written by really stupid glue-eating people, <laughs> and it definitely was, uh, Sydney Sweetie and Dakota Johnson have had a professional, mature, adult attitude about it, and it has caused them to have massive respect from the fan community. It's all it ever, that's all that we've ever asked for. Nobody has ever asked for fans to be worshipped. All we've said is, just have a little class. And it's incredible to me how far that goes. And so uh, a hat tip and a captain salute to Sydney Sweeney and Dakota Johnson for demonstrating that it is possible to be in Hollywood and have a professional mindset. You know, and by the way, I don't just point this out so that I can, you know, sit on my high horse and and uh, it's actually quite the opposite. I take inspiration from that because I, as an artist, I, too, have to face criticism and it's it's not easy. It's not easy to face criticism being on YouTube. You're going to face constant criticism and the and the more successful you are, the more criticism you're going to have. And, uh, and that creates resistance. That creates, that's a force of nature that's trying to push you away from doing your work. And so I find it inspiring for me personally to see someone who has participated in a film that totally failed, <laughs> failed in spectacular fashion. But look at how she handles that. Like, I can only hope that I will handle it with as, as much grace if I'm ever in that situation. So I take that as real personal inspiration. It inspires me to raise my game. When I see when I see professional talents like that, having that attitude about a failure that they're not blaming other people for and they're saying what they're grateful for and they are still showing appreciation and respect towards the audience. It's like, that is a call to action for me to and a reminder to me to always maintain that professional mindset. And so that's really the the biggest reason I like to highlight that. And also because look, we spend a lot of time. We spend a lot of time fighting off the gaslighting and the lies and the defamation of truly uh amateur and and really nasty people in Hollywood that are trying to blame audiences for them creating a bad product. And, uh, and it sucks. It sucks having to highlight that negativity and call it out as often as we do. So I like calling out the positive things. I like saying, hey, here's an example of something really positive and inspiring and awesome in, in the Hollywood industry, in the entertainment industry. I wish, I wish that the Sydney Sweeney's and the Dakota Johnson's and the Henry Cavill's and the uh, Kamala Khan's I wish that they outnumbered. I wish that they outnumbered the amateurs 10 to 1. I wish it wasn't the opposite. Unfortunately, it's the opposite. Uh, but I wish the ratio was 10 to 1 because then it would be more like the way things were about 30 years ago. It would be more like the way things were about 40 years ago. I'm not saying Hollywood was perfect back then. And I'm not saying Hollywood didn't have problems, right? Um you know, just because the storytelling was better back then, it doesn't excuse bad behavior behind the scenes on the set. So I'm not letting them off the hook for that. I'm just saying it would be going back to a time when the professionals were in business. It would be going back to a time when there were more professionals than not, rather than what we have now, where we're at a time where uh, the loons, <laughs> the, the loons are running the asylum. So there you go. Stafiari says, Madam Webb was a calamity, a disaster, a debacle, a catastrophe. Uh, correct. <laughs> Facts. <laughs> Facts. Fu Man Blue says, July is a good example of how everyone gets pushback, no matter how little it makes sense. Yeah, I mean, 
I do think he's a special case because because Eric July proved proved that everything he was saying about the comic book industry was correct by living it, by being the living example of that. Because if you know, if you remember, you know, wind the clock back to before the Ripaverse debuted. Before that, Eric July was uh, just just like everyone else on YouTube. He was another commentator on YouTube, and the popular the popular canard is that uh, if I'm using that word, let me double. Am I? What does acolyte mean? Uh, let's see. Am I using the word canard correctly? An unfounded rumor or story? I'm not using it correctly. That's actually so. What I'm actually saying is the narrative. That's what I'm really saying. That is the correct use. The narrative was that Eric July was, well, if you're if you have so many opinions about what's not working in comics, why don't you just make your own? And and the the implication there is that he can't. Those who can't do uh comment, right? That's sort of what the implication is. And and so what they were trying to what they were trying to do, his critics, was discredit all of his critiques by saying, Oh, you're just unhappy because you could never hack it in Marvel and DC. And and if you were in Marvel and DC, you'd be failing just like they are because of all the same reasons that have nothing to do with the message and SJW bullshit. Well, then Eric went out and did it. And he made $3.7 million and he disproved all of their arguments and proved all of his. And that's why he's kind of a special case, because in order for them to be right, he has to be a scammer or a shyster or something else. Right. And so so it's it's polit it's the politicization of everything. It's very sad. It's very unfortunate. Stop, Yuri says, can I fail as well as Eric, please? Oh, don't we all wish we could? We really do. I'm looking, I know that Star Fury pushed back on me <laughs> somewhere. He has to have. He has to have. <laughs> Star Fury, the one good thing about Madame Web. It didn't, though. But Star Fury, it did not. <laughs> the movie did not introduce you to Sydney Sweeney's um talents. Uh, because she was she was made sort of frumpy and unattractive in that movie, as was Dakota Johnson. I, I I get, but you're saying it indirectly. No, it was Sydney Sweeney who introduced you to Sydney Sweeney's boobs. <laughs> it was not the movie Madam Web, sir. It was not the movie Madam Web. <laughs> All right, now, calm down, Star Fury. <laughs> uh, well, that's why you let her play Dungeons and Dragons, Star Fury, so you have at least a chance. Not you know. Maybe a long shot, but it's a chance. You know, you certainly don't say no. Uh, <laughs> well, I never doubted it, Star Fury. You are a professional. You are a professional, Star Fury. Never let it be doubted. Hey, I discovered something kind of fun. Now, I don't know. Can I, can, do I dare play anything? I suppose. I suppose that uh, probably that was just HBO hitting me. So I probably can. I probably can play this. We'll give it a shot. But I'm I'm being careful. I don't want the channel to get an, a warning or anything here. But, but thanks to thanks to Mueller and his. And by the way, I love EFAP highlights. If you have not subscribed to EFAP highlights, like let's say you don't have eight hours to spare, you know, to see Mahler and the boys EFAP something, you can watch just like a 20 to 40 minute highlight reel. And I really enjoy watching those because it kind of just gives you, it just gives you all the cool stuff that they went over in an EFAP. Well, Mahler and the boys efapped a very curious, uh, a very curious video from a YouTuber known as Movie Bob. Now, this exploded on the internet like years ago. This is like a super old thing, and it exploded a long time ago. But they just kind of rediscovered it and unearthed it and went over it. And I had never heard this 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 uh, take before. But Movie Bob had an opinion about Halo's Covenant species that I found fascinating, and I thought I would share this with you. <laughs> and I thought, you know, this this just sums up everything wrong with SJW thinking about everything. Ha! 
Oh, you don't skip all this. Talked about whatever random nerdy thing is on my mind at the moment while these pop art representations of my frack. Okay, well, let's get to the lead, shall we? So Movie Bob is talking about Halo, and he had this to say about the Covenant. This... Now, to be fair, this makes sense in context. The Spartans are a military outfit specifically raised and scientifically augmented to be largely faceless, emotionless force of living weapons. They're a militaristic, quasi-fascist wet dream, basically, right down to being named after the society that wrote the book on militaristic, quasi-fascist wet dreams. This stuff has been the lifeblood of the- Everything is fascist. Everything is racist. Everything is fascist. The military sci-fi genre ever since Starship Troopers, except there the Space Marine guys were up against an enemy whose collective insect hive mind makeup made them even more faceless and anti-individualist, so it kind of balanced out. But in Halo, look who fights for the Covenant. Big guys, little guys, creatures from tons of different worlds in every color of the spectrum. I mean, just look at all these dudes for a minute. It's like Reach is being invaded by a Benetton ad from space. In terms of diversity... What the hell is a Benetton ad? <laughs> I have to I have to look this up real quick. Benetton? Benetton? I have no idea what that is. It's a global fashion brand based in... Uh, Ponzano, Veneto, Italy. Founded in 1965, Benetton Group has... Okay, so it's a fashion brand, and it's very... And they and it's for... It's for all different... Like, men, women, everybody. Okay, whatever. Uh, that's such an odd... That's so weird. It's a freaking weird comparison, bruh. The Covenant makes the Planeteers look like the KKK. Oh my and god! And, of course, these are the bad guys. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, all these different species come from different worlds because they were conquered and converted by the Covenant. So it's mainly diverse because it's essentially a slave army, which is- a He's saying that the Covenant, it's, the, the, the Covenant are really the good guys because, because they're diverse. They're diverse. The, the man is criticizing the Spartans for being quasi-fascistic. Meanwhile, meanwhile. And he's, he's acknowledging it. He's acknowledging it in his own words. The Covenant are. They are fascistic. They are a theocratic autocracy that is attempting to exterminate all of the human species. This is, this is why I always say that wokeness is sick. It is a, I, I, don't, I don't just mean malevolent because it is that too. I mean sick as in like mentally ill. This is a mental illness. To think this way. It's like, like, literally, literally, you are ignoring the fact that they are, they are a religious autocracy try, that are genocidal. <laughs> but they're diverse. You see, diversity is more important than those things. Of course, supposed to remind us in part of another famous multinational slave army that went to war with another bunch of guys called Spartans. But come on, how many people actually play Halo for the context? Think about how- <laughs> How many people play Halo for the context? <laughs> I do, sir! <laughs> I do! I play Halo for- I play Halo for the story! It's a great story! <laughs> it's like- Dude, in a world where, like, so many first-person shooters, you know, they, they would- you know, they, they would have a story, but it wouldn't be anything not necessarily super deep. You have Halo- well, I take that back, though, because a lot of first-person shooters actually do have really good stories. But Halo is like deep sci-fi with like a fully realized sci-fi Bible that, that talks about the lore and the backstory. Bungie created all that. And the story is is a rich sci-fi story. You are per, You are in this... And it's a deeply tragic story about this massively costly war of hu humanity is fighting for survival. See, see, this is why I say wokeness and SJW thinking, radical leftism, call it whatever you want. It is an anti-human movement. Only an anti-human way of thinking could read this into the Halo story. Literally the entire point, and, and Halo does not shy away from critiquing its own human culture. The Halo story is deeply critical of the UNSC and its motives. Not well, I mean, deeply is probably going a bit too far, but I would say that it, it certainly by the time you get to Halo 4, it gets a little more into that. But in the original Halo trilogy, there is an implied, there is an implied skepticism toward the UNSC and its motives in in terms of like what its 
motives might have been before the, ha the, the Covenant War. But the fact of the matter is, it's them or us. Like, it's them or us. There's no, there, there's no other way to look at it. And so, is the human species worth saving or not? Is it worth saving or not? Well, if you believe that humans are guilty, guilty, well, then you are inclined to agree with the covenant. This is why the heroes are villains and the villains are heroes in almost every modern Hollywood, because this is how those wackos think. This is how the wackos in Hollywood think. How this looks when viewed in the macro. Militaristic culture visibly pretext on submission of individual self to quasi-fascist collective equals good. Multiple races and species working together to a common goal equals evil. You admitted that they are slave species. You admitted that. <laughs> but he says working toward a common goal. Sir, <laughs> sir, they are an autocracy. Do you know what an autocracy is? Do you know what another word for autocracy is? Uh, fascism. <laughs> they are a fascist slave. They are a slave army enslaved to a religious fascistic organization that are engaged in an attempt to wipe out all human life. <laughs> but, oh, but they work together for a common goal. I mean, when the skinheads oh, and neo-Nazi bigots in general talk down about how diversity is bad and you shouldn't mix the races, isn't... That's a lie. That's a straw man argument lie. Nobody is saying diversity is bad. Nobody is saying that. We are saying that your sick world view is bad. <laughs> this is usually the basis of their crazy argument that mixed societies or mud races or whatever they call oh them tend to be these destructive unclean hordes while pure cultures emphasizing sameness and conformity are superior dude Look, dude th that that whole that was a line of about five straw men arguments all slammed and sandwiched together and it's like dude you know at this point you're not talking about us you're talking about yourself this is how you see the world <laughs> this is the sick way that you see the world we don't see the world this way you do. That's it's, it's unbelievable. The, yeah, the mentally ill ones, the, the inmates are running the asylum. I'm not here <clears> to <throat> accuse Bungie of promoting fascism, especially since what- Oh, well, thank you for that. That's very generous and magnanimous of you. We do see of Spartan creation does cast the whole thing in an air of morally ambiguous gray and holy crap. Wait, wait, can we go back to that? Did his eyes just turn blue? So hold up, you got this young guy with the conspicuously well-shaved head getting turned into the ultimate human weapon, and you know it worked because his eyes are blue now? Uh, Bungie, that's some pretty scary unintended symbolism there. This is some kind of self-parody, right? Right? Okay, maybe that's taking it too far. The show is called The Big Picture, after all. And in this case, the big picture isn't the creepy fascist undertones in Halo or the rather embarrassingly vast pantheon of Heinlein wannabe space marine stories. It's the fact that this primitive tribalistic idea of the pure and thus noble monoculture under threat by multiculture is still so tragically pervasive in the human imagination. Sir, sir, sir. <laughs> This is seriously one of the dumbest fucking people on the internet. <laughs> I mean, come on, man. Uh, <clears throat> let me explain something to you. Humanity is not under threat from the multicultural covenant. They are under threat from an attempt to exterminate the human race. <laughs> what is this? Why, why is this unclear to you? It's unbelievable. <laughs> they are that every planet is being glassed. Okay, <laughs> like. We don't, have, there's no choice. It doesn't even matter what the moral position of humanity is. There is no choice. There is no choice but to fight back. And they're losing. The whole point of Halo is that they're losing. And they've been losing for 27 straight years. <laughs> like, this is, it's, a, it's so he's like, well, oh, well, a, they're under threat from, from multiculturalism. No, they're under threat from being glass. That's what they're under threat from. <laughs> Stupid people. The glue eating, glue sniffing people. That it even crops up here, which is especially ironic since the whole idea of the Covenant as bad guys is supposed to be critical of blind loyalty to arcane belief systems. Why does some part of our collective psyche still fear the concept of racial or cultural mixing? And why is it so ingrained? That oh my God. <laughs> what? You know what also he ignores here is he ignores that like the elites 
like the 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 elite aliens are part of an extremely warlike militaristic society very much like the Spartans in which they are they're a kind of warrior samurai culture that there's no implication that there isn't and there's even racial division among the co- the covenant cuz the brutes hate the elites and the elites hate the brutes so you're you're totally ignoring you're ignoring the fact that the covenant is at least as militaristic as the Spartans and the UNSC at least if not more there's even there's even more militarism on the covenant side we hardly even notice it anymore more importantly why aren't we more inclined to try noticing it and even getting rid of it oh my god you wackos you you never give it a rest do you every minute of your life is defined through looking for you know a nazi or a racist behind every bush it's it's a miserable way to live i pity it i'm bob and that's the big picture I know. I'm late to the party on this guy. I know. I know. He's been around forever. And everyone's known movie Bob is a wacko. I'm just saying. That's stunning to me. That is. But it's also, it's like, that's a super old video. Like, when was that video released? This was, uh, was it really? 12 years ago. 12 years old, this video is. And, And Mahler dug it up recently. And that's how I found it. But I'm like, does that not give you a cl- This is how we got here, folks. This is how we got here. Wackos like this are running the game industry. They are running Disney. They are running everything. And this is how they think about everything right now. It's it's quite a, the 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 ability of the human mind to literally make itself insane. It never ceases to amaze me. It never ceases to amaze me. You know, this is why things like objective reality and freedom of speech truly are so important because we as individuals are all susceptible to going mad. Like we are. That's a, that's just the nature of our existence. But how do we keep sane? How do we stay sane? We stay sane by checking each other on our bullshit. That's why that's why having a professional mindset as an artist is so important. You know, it's important because it's about being sane. You know, it's about it's about understanding that like you're mortal, you and that you're fallible and that you're flawed. And and hearing the hearing the reactions of the audience and taking it in stride is about staying sane and grounded. Grounded. You know, and we can't do that in a vacuum. We can't do that alone. There's a great scene in the film Interstellar, of which I'm a great fan. I think it's Nolan's best film, and it's my favorite Nolan film, uh, Interstellar. And uh, there's a scene in which they uncover one of the astronauts who has been, he, he, I think his partner on the mission died. It's been a while since I watched it, but I think his, his partner on the mission died, and so he put himself into stasis waiting for rescue. And it's been years, and he's been basically living alone on this barren planet for years. And when he sees Matthew McConaughey's character, um, he immediate Cooper, he immediately just like hugs him, and he's like, "Oh my God, I never thought I'd see another human again." And you just get the sense that he has gone totally, he's gone totally cuckoo. And he has this great line that he says to, um, to Coop, which is, "Pray that you never know what it's like." Uh, I forget the exact line, but it's something like to to go years without ever seeing another human face. Like, you know, pray you never know what that's like. And I just thought that's a really great line because it, it illustrates that we are social creatures. We require community and connection. Um, and and uh, that's what we're building here on the Swords and Starship channel, a fellowship. So like and subscribe if you're enjoying the content. But But my point is, that's the point of being grounded is to not go insane and to not go Looney Tunes. Guys like Movie Bob, they're insane. They've gone down a weird rabbit hole that has somehow allowed them to completely reverse morality. <laughs> you know, it's incredible to me that like he literally is so he is so programmed like a heat seeking missile to find the to find the fascism. There's fascism here. I just know it. And he can he goes looking for it. And it's like he totally just ignores the fact that he's talking about that it's right in front of his face. What you're looking for is the fascistic covenant that is wiping out humanity. That the the covenant are ethnic cleansers. They're ethnic cleansers. 
And you're ignoring that. You're ignoring that because you're looking for the fascism in the Spartans. It's it's unbelievable, folks. And then he's and then he's twisting that into saying that the fact that this is the video game we want to play means that we're the one we're the problem. Dude, they're wackos, folks. That they, they have a sick worldview. <laughs> it's so it's so sick, man. Uh, stop here. He says, I'm Bob and I am clinically diagnosed moron. Like he is bad, folks. Wrangler says, I'm listening while making supper. This guy has me laughing my ass off. This has got to be a parody of what an SJW would say. No, dude, Movie Bob is the original. He's the original SJW. He's been around for decades now. And uh, he he's he is part of the beginnings of this movement that has led us to where we are. This is classic. This is classic left-wing loon thinking. And what's so amazing about this is... Um, he makes this claim. He he implies that like the Halo universe is not self-critical. He implies that th- that the whole narrative of the Spartans and the UNSC is is like totally patriotic, and it, it it has no skepticism whatsoever about itself or its culture. And it's like, well, to be fair, the the subject of the Halo story is kind of just an existential, you know, survival. It's a story of survival. The human species is trying to survive. That's basically all it is. Um, so it so it's like sitting there and trying to talk about well, The Walking Dead is a is a metaphor about how multicultural zombies are a threat to us. And it's like, no, it's about not getting your brains eaten. That's really what The Walking Dead is about. But never mind. So so he's kind of missing the point of Halo. But that being said, there is enough there in Halo if you're looking for it to imply that there are very deep questions about military culture and uh and a society based on more on honor you know there's a great there's a great um setup in halo 2 halo 2 opens with a tale of a hero and a villain right and the hero is master chief who is coming home to a hero's welcome because he saved the day in halo 1 he destroyed the halo ring he saved uh the human species for another day uh, and he is being he is being rewarded with with medals and honors and accolades. Juxtaposed with this, we see the leader of the opposing side, which was the who later becomes the arbiter. But he is the elite general that was that was the leader of the covenant who failed to protect the halo ring and was defeated by Master Chief. And this this is like one of their most decorated military commanders. But he is being he is being put on trial. And he's being stripped of his rank and he's being publicly shamed and humiliated and disgraced for failure. And the clear implication of those two scenes is to say that the difference between being the hero and the villain is the difference between victory and defeat. Well, that's pretty brilliant. And that actually implies a lot of moral complexity on both sides. It's kind of implying that if Master Chief had failed in the first game, it might have been Master Chief who was on trial, and it would have been the the arbiter, for lack of a better term, who was being celebrated and awarded a medal. And the only difference between those two outcomes on either side was victory and defeat. And what was the difference between victory and defeat? Honestly, a lot of it had to do with a narrow edge of luck. And I think that's pretty brilliant because it's actually drawing quite a bit of moral complexity to, on both sides. Both Master Chief and the Arbiter are sort of, they're both sort of caught up in the currents of history. They are both products of their own society and they are both fully at the mercy of the norms of honor and military virtue of their respective societies. And I find that to be a deeply complex and morally nuanced story for both for both sides. It's incredible to me that Movie Bob is so blinded by his wacko left-wing view, he can't see those things. Like, he can't see that depth, and he can't see that moral complexity that's right in front of his face. It's a great story. It's also why these are the same people that think that the American military's purpose is is uh, acceptance and pride and diversity and it's like dude no it's if we are if we are about to be wiped out the the purpose of the military is to stop that from happening if we're being attacked or invaded the purpose of the military is to defend ourselves the military is a weapon okay the military is never going to be the setting 
of a utopia. It isn't. That's not its purpose, nor should it be. It's so silly. It's like, oh, the UNSC is very militaristic. Well, it's about a military. <laughs> what do you want? The purpose of a military is to win wars, you idiot. <laughs> like, it's not supposed to be sunshine and bunnies. It's not supposed to be a laboratory of social experimentation. It exists for one purpose, to break things. The question of any military story's morality is about what is the military aimed at and how is the military conducting itself in achieving those aims. And and there is a difference. There is a difference in how militaries conduct themselves. So, yes, that's movie, Bob. Uh, what, a, what a wacko. What an absolute wacko. Uh, Stafiare says, there is now research that says SJWs are more miserable than normal people. Of course they are. They politicize every everything is a political war to them. And it's like <clears throat> nothing would make me happier than for this to be over. Like th this culture war and all this nonsense and politicization of sports and movies and comic books and literally every level of human society and existence is being is being weaponized and politicized. You can't buy you cannot buy medicine for your headache without on the packaging getting some kind of lecture about diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's, it's, and I'm not joking, folks. <laughs> they talk about pain equity with regards to, I think it was Advil or Tylenol, I forget which brand. Um, they have turned everything into a battleground, and we find ourselves in the position of having to refute, refute their claims. Their claims. Nobody was claiming that Spartans had to have blue eyes as if that was some kind of, like, I, honest to God, whether that's intentional or not, who even knows? It's just part of the story. Maybe, maybe the game developers were making a point about that. Maybe not. But the point is that, like, you're reading that into everything, Movie Bob, not us. <laughs> like, you're the one that's gone looking for all this stuff. And you've put us in the position of having to address these claims because our choice is either to agree with you or be destroyed. Um, and it's like, well, I choose neither. I choose your point of view is sick and it's going down. It's going down. Um, but the day that this ends, the day that we are no longer being forced to bend the knee, this is over because I don't want to talk about this stuff anymore. I want to talk about lore. I want to talk about, I would like the fallout show to be good. I would like it to be good so that we could talk about what a fun story it was the way we do with house of the dragon or Picard season three or one piece. I would rather. I would rather have 10 of those for every one Ahsoka or every one Echo. I would love to have 10 One Pieces. Now, maybe that's unrealistic because the whole point of good storytelling is it's exceptional. But I think we could do better than 10 to 1 bad things, like 10 bad things to one good thing. I think we could beat that ratio, so... Fu Man Blue says, or live long enough to see yourself become the villain. Like, that line is so poignant. Written by Jonathan Nolan, of all people. Uh, I A break for the sippy cup. Fu Man Blue points out the captain has a sippy cup. This is not a sippy cup, Fu Man Blue. It is, it is an athlete's... It is an athlete's... Uh, what would you call it? An athlete's water bottle. It's an athletic water bottle. The captain is an athlete, Fu Man Blue. <laughs> I swear you can trust me on this Fu Man Blue Fu Man Blue says the military is a select group of your neighbors that have agreed to put down their lives to protect you well in a in a free society that's what they are you know it's quite incredible to me that guys like Movie Bob you know th they sort of view all militaries as the same they everything is morally gray morally, th these are the same idiots that say that Star Wars is not about good and evil and it's like they they take for granted the society that they were born into. I mean, they take for granted the freedoms that they have. You know, the idea of an all-volunteer military that is about citizens who are defending their own lives and property when they agree to military service. I mean, that is the point. This goes all the way back to the ancient Greek democracies. That was rare. In the ancient world of ancient Greece... Uh, the idea that these were all volunteer citizens that were fighting to protect their own farms that they owned 
that was unusual in the ancient world. That was I, that was the the exception, not the rule. And so what Movie Bob is failing to understand is that for most of human history, in almost every human society, militaries were not volunteers. They were not citizens. They were slaves. They were peasants. They were owned property. And they were being sent to war in a meat grinder to accomplish the goals of their emperor or their king or their, or their samurai lord or whoever it was. Um, it was rare. It was rare to meet a society in which it was free citizens who had property rights that were fighting in their own defense, in the defense of their own neighbors by choice. Um, <clears throat> so that is why we Americans, or in your case, Starfury, you British, that's why we admire in Western civilizations and free societies, we admire our volunteer militaries because they represent free people defending their, in their own interests. That is a very different thing than what you find in totalitarian societies. And so uh, it's a very, you know, the, the thing that all Wokies, SJWs, uh, just radical wackos have in common is they have a low resolution view of humanity. They have a low resolution view of Western civilization. They have a low resolution view of militaries. I mean, can you think of any better example than the fact that he reduced the covenant? He reduced the covenant, which are a very complex cultural society if you're paying attention when you're playing the Halo games. He reduced them to the lowest common denominator. There's big ones and there's small ones and they're working together. That's all he can see. <laughs> it's like he said, that is a low resolution view of the covenant. That is a low resolution view of, he even says, well, most people, let's be real. Most people don't play Halo for the context. Uh, project much? <laughs> like, yeah, you don't play it for the context. Uh, those of us who are interested and are curious people, we do. We do. Star Fury says, uh, John 117, that would be, and that would be Master Chief, is fundamentally a slave who has been conditioned and brainwashed to be the ultimate warrior. However, he breaks his conditioning somewhat and becomes more than a weapon. And that is a very transient point, Star Fury. That is a very, very insightful point that movie Bob does not does not at all see. You know, this is what I this is why I say like the Halo show on Paramount is so stupid because they don't understand that. The actual, the actual demonstration of who Master Chief is, is in what he does, not what he says. It's in what he does. It's the fact that he never gives up. He never quits. And there are points in the story where Master Chief John 117 could do less if he wanted to. He could do less than the maximum to save humanity. If he wanted to, he could run off with Cortana and just forget about humanity. He could do that. And there's probably stories you could tell where that would be a, a, a fitting story. Uh, but Master Chief doesn't do that. Even, even though Master Chief sort of starts out as a slave, he chooses to save humanity. Even though he doesn't totally have a stake in humanity. You know, you get the feeling with Master Chief and any Spartan, uh, they don't get to go home at the end of the day. They go into cryo sleep until the next mission. They don't get to go home and mingle with the civilians and have like a family and a normal life. And that's part of the tragedy. And it's it's part of the, as you correctly identify, Stafiore, it is part of the implicit critique of the of the games. The games are implicitly critiquing this society by showing not telling. See, see, the reason we have all this stupid exposition and every line has to be stated, they have to state the moral purpose of every story in things like the Acolyte. This is about power and who is allowed to use it. Well, that's for the idiots. The glue eaters like Movie Bob is the reason we have stupid lines like that. Because, because uh, we've lost the fine art of showing and not telling. And the thing about Master Chief in the games is he demonstrates who he is by what he does over the course of the games. So yeah, it's exactly you're exactly right about that, Star Fury. That is what movie Bob cannot see. I've got all my chats are high. Okay, there we go. And yes, I we all love Master Chief in the games. He's awesome. He is perfect as is as a character, and he does not need 
He does not need to be rewit rewritten into this whiny, uh, this whiny, dramatic, wringing his hands, crybaby, uh, played by Paul Schreiber, a.k.a. Buttface. A.k.a. Buttface is what I call Paul Schreiber, because he has a face shaped like the northbound end of a southbound goat, okay? He, he's a very unfortunate looking man. He's just, he's a very unfortunate looking man. Fu Man Blue says, yeah, you'll always be safe, but now you have butt face. <laughs> yeah, butt face. That's what I call him. Uh, Paul Schreiber. Let me, let, where, where is my picture? <laughs> I love it. I, I renamed the file so I can always find it, you know? Uh, yes, here it is. Come now, Apple. Oh, geez. Don't fail me now. All right, what else have I got? While that, while it is locating that uh, magnificent picture, uh, I am going to see what else is in the stack of stuff. <laughs> Dude, I had so many, there were so many trailers today. There was so much to cover. Uh, so much to cover. I think, you know, we're probably going to wrap it up, folks. I think we're probably going to wrap this one up soon. Um, however, I do think I'll cover this story before I do. We are close to the day no ma of the captain's cast here on the Swords and Starship channel. Why isn't it finding it? Maybe I deleted it. I might have. I may have. I may have. It's in here, though. I know it is because I just... Come on. There it is. I got it. There it is. Yeah, here we go. Share. Present. Uh, mm, yeah, share screen. Here we go. Here we go. There it is. There he is. This is, this is the, this is from a, I literally snapped this picture from the Halo show on Paramount Plus. This is Master Chief. <laughs> this is Master Chief. Look at him. This is the scene where he's crying in the AI brothel. He's crying to a fake AI Cortana about his childhood. I, 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 just, I want you to pretend to be Cortana. It's like butt face. That's what he is. Anyway. It's nothing personal. It's nothing. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I'm just saying... I'm just saying he's an unfortunate looking man who seems to think the purpose of the Halo show is to smear his face over every single scene. It's like, why can't he have the respect of a Carl Urban? Why can't he have the respect of a Carl Urban playing Judge Dredd who never takes off the helmet and he's just grizzled and he's just like, Mama's not the law. I am the law. It's like, that's a man right there. That is a, that is a, that is a, Good performance of a Master Chief-like character. Uh, so watch Dread. There you go. Uh, looks like Tom Hardy's retarded half-brothers as Fu Man Blue. And I fairly agree with that. I do. I truly do. Okay, here we go. Uh, let me share this with you, my dear chat. My dear Sailors and Star Knots. Uh, share screen. Dude, this is... You, you, you know, I always say, like, these... You, you know, Elon Musk did this interview with Don Lemon, okay? Uh, it was the oiliest, slimiest, most disgusting uh, um, performance of a so-called journalist I've ever seen. I mean, Don Lemon was like a serial killer who was trying to not allow his victim to get suspicious. I mean, it was this, it was sick. He has the he he was like Patrick Bateman in uh, American Psycho. He he had this awkward affect, this weird, like, and, and he would say the most offensive, condescending thing to Elon, and then Elon would start would start to get frustrated. And he'd be like, I'm not trying to offend you, Elon. Do not be offended by me. I am only trying to ask questions. Uh, now, tell me, why was your childhood so nasty? And how many drugs are you taking, Elon? How How much do you not care about racism? I'm not trying to offend you, Elon. I am your friend. You can trust me. I was like, oh my God, Elon had to have needed a shower. He had to have needed a shower after sitting with that scumbag for an hour. It was the most slimy, disgusting thing I've ever seen in my life. And do you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of how the president of Argentina, Javier Malay, he's like, he was giving an interview and someone was like, um, you know, why are you so critical of your left-wing opponents or whatever? And he said, because you cannot give a shit leftist an inch. In other words, you cannot negotiate with psychopaths. You cannot negotiate with psychopaths. You just can't. 
because they're crazy. They're out of their minds right now. Now, if someone wants to have a... Now, listen, everyone is welcome on the Swords of Starship channel. If you are liberal, pull up a chair. I want you here. I like liberals, moderates, conservatives, libertarians, whatever. Just don't be a wacko. That's all. You know, which that is an, a totalitarian. So so you've got this story with J.K. Rowling. This from Bounding Into Comics. Check this out, chat. This is why you cannot, you cannot negotiate with terrorists. You just can't. Uh, Harry Potter author J.K. Rowling threatens legal action against transgender activists who attempted to dox one of her daughters. Quote, you F around with my kids' safety and privacy and you'll find out. By the way, J.K. Rowling, total lib. She's a liberal, okay? J.K. Rowling's opinions on transgender ideology has made her the target of incessant attacks on social media, and the latest onslaught of abuse has been propelled by a Harry Potter fan account that shamelessly attempted to dox one of her daughters. Wackos, folks. Wackos. Uh, the account in question goes by the name Wizarding News and is a LGBTQIA plus activist account that has made it its mission to reporting on the demise of J.K. Rowling's legacy. I mean, these wackos have set back like just, just you know, regular gay and lesbian people who just want to live their lives. They have been set back like decades by these wacko lunatics. It's pretty amazing, really. Uh, so anyway, uh, Wizarding News that this wacko lunatic account says, reminder that J.K. Rowling's eldest daughter, the one with whom she was famously pregnant while writing Harry Potter, changed her last name to literally get away from Rowling and move to Portugal. So J.K. Rowling quote tweeted, who this person has J.K. Rowling blocked, and Rowling retweeted the post and said, could somebody who isn't blocked by this account tell them that this is untrue in all respects, as I suspect they already know, lying about my kids is a new low, even by this website's subterranean standards. Sharing yet another screenshot of Wizarding News, which claimed, uh, did you know J.K. Rowling is a grandmother? Have any of you seen her talk about grandchildren? J.K. Rowling again responds, again, completely false at Wizarding News. I have no grandchildren. What are you gaining by posting these lies? You're painting a target on people who have no connection with me, who aren't my relatives. You surely know what you're doing, but persist. Hate me all you like, but your actions are having real world consequences for people I don't even know. I mean, she's pointing out that like, you're putting it some other poor person who is named Rowling is going to be getting harassment and hate because you're lying and you're saying that they are my grandchildren and they're not. Rowling went on to say, this is not a joke. The baby and its mother have no... Con oh, well, because what happened was then um, there was a site, there was a site called uh, For Women Scotland, or an account, I should say, that quote tweeted this and said, this disgusting site has posted pictures of the baby they falsely claimed was J.K. Rowling's grandchild with handy location details. If that child was kidnapped because of their lies, would they accept responsibility because the poor woman they are doxing probably has no clue they are targeting her? To which J.K. Rowling said, this is not a joke. The baby and its mother have no connection with me at Wizarding News. That isn't my daughter. Your vendetta against me is causing collateral damage to innocent people. If legal action is the only way to protect them, in other words, strangers that she doesn't know, I will take it. Um, so then Wizarding News says, uh, deleted the post with photos and linked to the Instagram hours ago, uh, J.O., Joe. Glad you seem to be self-aware enough that you're now publicly acknowledging the hate your bigoted rhetoric engenders. To which Rowling replied, you have me blocked or I could respond directly, Wizarding News. You've posted fo fabrications about my daughter. You have doxxed and targeted a mother with no connection to me. I want a retraction and an apology or we go to lawyers. Um, and then they, uh, it continues because Wizarding News did not recant. And she says, I've done everything I can to keep my children out of the public eye. My eldest daughter doesn't owe you or anyone else details of her private life. However, for the avoidance of doubt, Number one, contrary to your claims, we are very close and we last talked an hour ago. We discussed your posts, which have angered and distressed her. Number two, contrary to your claims, she does not live in Portugal. Number three, contrary to your claims, she has no children. Number four, the young mother whose photograph and personal details you published is not my daughter. 
and has no relation to me whatsoever. You've published easily disproven and damaging falsehoods. Should we go to legal proceedings, you will need to show why, in spite of being told the truth, you neither retracted nor apologized. In the absence of any such retraction and apology, the next communication you receive will be from my lawyer. Um, and then, let's see, uh, she, I think they made, what, what was this? Because they had this response, which was basically saying, here's one. It claimed that Jessica Ante's Rowling's daughter had 11,000 Instagram followers referencing the public account in Portugal. So anyway, there was more drama with it. And she said, uh, J.K. Rowling says, no real apology, no, retra no retraction, continuing to insinuate I'm lying. This is not my daughter. Are you so deluded you imagine I deny something so easily proven if true? Your behavior is not only despicable, but dangerous. And then the piece de resistance, J.K. Rowling basically replied to one of her fans who was kind of work, you know, helping her call out some of this shit. And she just said, lawyers are on it. I'm done. This man tried to put a target on my daughter. He made his intent perfectly explicit and continued to post pictures and details of the wrong girl while insinuating I was lying about her being unrelated to me. You fuck around with my kid's safety and you'll find out. And to that, I just have to say for J.K. Rowling, uh... Fire your full broadside, J.K. Go get him, these wackos. Now, why do I bring this up? Why why do I highlight that story? I highlight that story because, um, you know, I always think of this this scene in, in Lost, right? I think of this scene in Lost where they first encounter Benjamin Linus and he's pretending to be a civilian, one of the passengers, and uh, the, the crazy lady, the survivalist who's been living on the island, she tells... Um, she tells Jack that, like, you've got to interrogate this guy until he tells you the truth because he will lie and he will lie and he will lie and he will deny he's part of the others, but he is part of the others and you'll find out. And uh, and so the others are kind of these 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 uh, enemies on the island. They're always like messing with the the survivors of the plane crash. Right. And what was so great about the episode is that episode works very hard to convince you, the audience, that Benjamin Linus really, truly is the victim and he's not hes not the enemy. Uh, the French lady's crazy. She doesn't know what she's talking about. And then in the very final part of the episode, he reveals he absolutely is one of the others and he's a bad guy, right? And I just love that part where she's like, he will lie and he will lie and he will lie and he will lie. And it's like, that's what I talk about when I say you cannot negotiate with wackos, right? It's like these wackos, they lie and they lie and they lie. And the only thing you can do is defeat them. That is the only thing you can do. That's what Eric July has to do. <laughs> that's what that's what um, anyone who is standing up to these people has to do. And so I bring it out so that when you encounter their gaslighting, when you encounter them trying to say it's you're the you are the ones that are the bigots, you are the ones that don't like women in movies or whatever stupid bullshit uh, line that they feed you. Um, this is who they are. This is who they are. And this and this is a malevolent. This is a malevolent worldview to be going after people that aren't even related to J.K. As sick as that is to go after her daughter, they're going after people that aren't even related to her. Innocent bystanders. These are the people that lecture us about fascism. These are the people that lecture us about, about inclusive, inclusivity and, be, you know, kindness. Pass it on. And it's like, yeah, that's who they really are. Never forget it. So there you go. <laughs> I'm not putting that one up, Star Fury, but I I approve. Uh, yeah, Star Fury says, but I am a bigot. Last time I checked, they tell me all the time. Yeah, yeah, and they're the they're the ones that engage, the ones that are so worried about fascism. Right? That, look at how they behave. Look at how they behave. You know, and, and what's and it's so perfect because the Sweet Baby Ink story is a perfect example. It's like a guy on Steam posts a list of games Sweet Baby Ink is involved in. Does he dox anyone? No. Does he does he go after anyone's kids? No. Does he stoke a bunch of false flagging on their YouTube channel? No. Does he does he try and petition to get someone deplatformed? No. All he says is, here's some information. These are games they're involved with. That's it. 
And what do they say? Oh, this is bullying. This is harassment. This is deplatforming. Because that's exactly what they would do in his position. That's exactly what they would do. They wouldn't have stopped at a list. They love lists. <laughs> you know? So anyway, never let them gaslight you uh, into doubting yourself is, uh, is my point there. But I do, I gotta say, I love, I love JK Rowling's style, man. She's like, she's like, uh, we're going to lawyers. I love, I love how she worded that. We're going to lawyers. <laughs> it's like, dude, that's, if, if I were JK, JK's place, uh, it would be like times five for me. I would, my goal would be to absolutely ruin that account, like ruin it, uh, with my, with my lawyers. So, that's what I would do. And that's what she's doing. And she should. And she should. It's like, I may disagree with everything J.K. Rowling believes about the world. And to be fair, you know, it's her side that has put up with a lot of this wacko crap for a long time. And they've kind of dug this hole. Um, and that, and they deserve the responsibility for that. But at the same time, you know, I will always defend the right, everyone's right, to say to say the beliefs they have, to speak out, to have their opinion. But where we draw the line is when you attempt to use that right to 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 harm someone. When not, and I don't mean hurt their fevies. I mean they're trying to literally threaten the life of of an innocent woman. It's like that's where you draw the line. We're not going to put up with that. And uh, and so there you go. There you go. So well, it has been a barn burner. It has been a barn burner episode, as usual here on the Captain's Cast, and I appreciate you hanging out with me, chat. I know you have a lot of choices out there, and you chose the Captain's Cast here on the Swords of Starship channel, and uh, I hope I put on a good show for you. Yeah, I wish I could tell you Ghostbusters Afterlife was better. You know, it's just, it's not, I don't know, it's, it's, uh... It wasn't the worst thing I've seen. <laughs> I did not hate it, as the shills would say. Staffiori thinks it was crap. Staffiori thinks it was absolute crap. So, uh, Boom Man Blue says, Fun times, me boys. Uh, it always is here on this Captain's Cast. Make sure you are on the Discord. We are going to be setting up a Fallout game. And we've got Stormcrow. Stormcrow's working on something. But we're going to work on that, so... Folks, uh, you know, the news is good news because the, all those poor game developers that are crying, crying at the sky, uh, there wasn't that many of them. It's a very big conference. There was only like 50 of them that showed up to that thing. Um, it's because they're being, they are losing in the marketplace of ideas. And what that means is we are, we are going to see a revivification of good storytelling and good games not from the AAA, not from Hollywood, but from independent quarters, and that is as it should be. You are the future, my dear sailors and star knots. And I, for one, am thrilled and excited to be a part of it, and I'm excited to be a part of you, a, a part of your part in this movement, which is extraordinarily, typically eloquent way of putting it. I'm excited to be on this journey with you. Thank you for your super chats. Thank you for your support. Thank you for just being here. And uh, this is the Captain's Cast on Swords and Starships channel. And until next time, this is Captain Garrett saying, I will see you, my dear sailors and starnauts, out there. <laughs>